Like the only thing I know about Eric Andre is the um just the the video of Hannibal going Hey, Eric, look at me. Bitch. And then there's the gif of uh Eric Andre just shooting Hannibal with a with a gun. Yeah, it's, it's a source of so many good memes is that Eric Andre is a genius. He was in um Lion King 2019 and just one of the hyenas in the Lion King 2019. Was he actually? Yeah, he was in it, and I really wish it was just him doing what he usually does. That would that, <laughs> that would have been pretty fucking great. <laughs> that would have been a better movie. It probably would have. Yes. <laughs> and okay. and he's got a little segment on bird up where he just goes in the street in a green in a green screen suit. That's just his face with a bird on his shoulder. Yeah, bird he up. Says, dun, dun, dun. And, and the whole joke is that he's supposed to be invisible, but he's never actually invisible. And you just lock one man in an editing room with a stack of cocaine and, or acid. And just say, get this out in eight hours. And he says, I got you, fam. And then you get to see this whole four minute long segment. But it feels like 40 minutes when you watch it. If it feels longer, I don't know if that necessarily makes it good. Hey, uh, <clears throat> we start recording? Yes, we are recording. If you want to see an even longer video, um, it feels longer, but it's not. You can watch Living with Wario. I don't. Just watch I that. don't know if I want to do that. <laughs> Living with Wario. That yeah, is. This, uh, I, I imagine if you want to know what that's like, just watch any King Ass Ripper video. <laughs> Mario sitting there goes like, "I got my large pizza, ha, huh, and I'm gonna drench it in sausage gravy." <laughs> The thing where he's just in the kitchen, just farting up a store. Yep. <laughs> I'm gonna fart in my roommate's store. Ha. <laughs> you're, you were expect, you were expect that man to just die of a heart attack. Hey, I <laughs> was. When I first saw the video, I'm like, that is so much cholesterol. How is he not dead? <laughs> we have found the actual burger man. <laughs> we have found the burger man from Ori from the goddamn, from World of Darkness. <laughs> that is him. If, yeah. From the ZZ Top video. Yes. <laughs> uh, if it wasn't for Content ID, we would be playing that right now because we are talking mm. about the Ratkin today, and this is a book that really makes you feel like an idiot when you read it. Well, yeah, because it's implied that both that both the narrator and you, the reader, are idiots. It begin well, with. To be uh, fair, saying, I Ryan? am an idiot. To be fair, I am an idiot. You're not an no, idiot. You're just a get a rune. Uh, you, you, the thing is, you don't think things out, and Grim tends to come out of situations A-OK. -okay. Tyler th overthinks everything and gets his ass beat for it. Yeah. What you get for overthinking? Yeah, that's right. I should probably just fight things more often. Yeah. And straight. And, I've been saying it for a while. Uh, I am, like, genuinely stoked for you. Like, if if you do follow through with Ridgecross Appalachia, I would love to see what you got. <sighs> I... Uh, Kyle, I, like we mid, we did a whole episode on this. It's not that hard to story tell. You no, know, no, it isn't. And I'll tell you, it's even easier with World of Darkness because for the Hunch of the Reckoning game I've been running on Fridays, I've been using Google Map images uh, for the backgrounds, that's and that's fair. been about it, really. Yep. If you want a if you want a more uh, battle map kind of thing, we'll just take a picture of the street view or the satellite images, and then bam, that's all you really need. Yeah, it's more than likely it's what I'm gonna do, but in my head, I like I'm again, I'm I'm overthinking it. The scope of the project seems to be increasing exponentially the more I think it over. Yeah, just like to stop thinking so much about it. That, like that's the same. Th you gotta be more like Ryan. And the thing is with the rat. The thing is with the ratkin. Let's get on top of with the ratkin. I I digress. Right. The ratkin were put on this earth to kill. That's it. That's what the, that's what they're here for. They're here to kill. They they want to see. Blood in their, they want to see blood in their teeth. Uh, Gormaz, I want to see burnt dead, dead bodies. bodies. I, I want to kill. kill. I want to kill. <laughs> and a guy ran in the room and said, you're my boy. But she actually gave it over to the Garu, and then the rat kid said, what the fuck, this is literally my only job. Yep. Uh, you gotta love the rat kid. They'll always be the bridesmaid, never the bride. It feels like and... a lot of the Pharaoh, in all honesty. A lot of the pharaoh just get cucked at the end. Well, that's you're, because the Garou uh, are just better than them. 
you're, you're not your God's chosen people. That's why. <clears throat> Basically. Right. So to get into detail with the Ratkin, the Ratkin in concept, they are here to kill. I've told you before that World of Darkness is not afraid to wear its influence on its sleeve. Nosferatu are based off of old American movies. The Corex came from Ravenloft from D&D. Ratkin are basically the Skaven from Warhammer. Basically the Skaven. <laughs> yes. I mean, besides the the twitchy speech that they do, the double speak, it this is just what if we had the Skaven, but we put them in the modern day, and that's that's not a bad thing to like have like a Captain Earth stats or XP idea, because as we discussed with uh, Vigo Corinth in our vampire game. He's based off a lot, a lot of different stuff, and he turned out to be not just our favorite character, but um, a lot of our audience members too. Yeah, well, I mean, we've all we've had that discussion about why Vigo works so well as a villain. It's, it's not like what you uh, inspire the character off of; it's the inspiration plus what you do with the character. And from that point forward, because Kyle, if we were to run Descent into Avernus. The the way I ran Zerial and the way you would run Zerial, those would be two different characters by the end of the day. Very much so. So that's that's the big picture here. Just because it's kind of copies something does not make it necessarily bad. I mean, you want to do like the whole South Park Simpsons did it kind of thing, where you can't do an episode of South Park because Simpsons did it. You can't have a, a Star Wars movie because Star Trek did it. You just got like great at the end of the day. And sometimes you see something that somebody or else made, uh, made already, and you think, I can do that, but I can put my own spin to it. Which is why we are making the 3.5 project, because I know I can do what Justin did, but better. In fact, that book's almost done. I'm about to finish it, like, in six months, instead of the, the eight-month period I gave myself. I just need a set release date for it now. Yeah, you're almost there. I still find it kind of amazing how you managed to rally so many people around it, but I guess that means it's something that people really want. We also have like a pretty decent opposition too, because I, uh, Lore by Night, I have nothing against the man himself, but he's not a fan of us, and neither are his viewers. And you know what? Because you're vocal about me, that proves that I'm doing something right, and <laughs> I would love to be in the middle of this culture war. I'm here to save you from yourself. That's why I'm making this content. And that's <laughs> wait, wait. Someone's not a fan of us. Uh, no, that <laughs> you were surprised about this, Ryan. Ryan, sick him. You know what? <laughs> I just want to take this opportunity. Who did, who did you say it was? Lore by Night. He he actually does have like pretty good content production values. Uh, he does do his episodes in character. He does. He plays a Nosferatu. And he makes good content, but I really do not agree with where he stands politically, and his fans are even worse. And, you know, if you want to flame me, I'm waiting for you in the comments section. Oh, dear lord. Oh, you know what? I just want to say <laughs> thank you, because any attention is good attention. <laughs> See, this is what... You need to learn, like, what, um... I keep forgetting who Citizen King was made about, but he did the right thing in giving it no publicity. No. Hate the thing so much to stop engaging with it. That's, that's all you need to do, dude. It wasn't Orson Welles. I don't remember the guy's name. Orson Welles was yeah, in guy, the like, thing. No, no it's the guy like, who it was like the president of MGM that he made to say about. Gotcha. The guy I digress. <clears throat> he began the Ratkin book with this schizo post comic about a Ratkin who goes to McDonald's and gets a hamburger, only to learn that the guy who sold him the hamburger is a demon. He calls his Ratkin friends and they shoot up the McDonald's only for a demon to come out from the basement and kill him. That and, and, and that's the comic. That's pretty fucking tight. I might need to read that. <laughs> I think and, I don't know if I like that Freak Legion or Sergeant Rage more. It, it feels like you're losing your damn mind with it because it's so silly. <laughs> I'm, and I'm here for it. I, I like it. I like that World Darkness bounces the line between stupid and actually disturbing yeah I, i've there are so few stories that do that that's why i like rob uh, zombies films is because they do that especially house of a thousand corpses oh all, all of his movies except for el super Bisto. yeah yeah because fuck john k <laughs> but um but going into detail about the history uh not that much in the book actually brian campbell is where he should be in the pilot seat for the Ratkin book. 
and you've got so many artists for this dude. You've got uh, Mitch Bird, Joe Corney, Brian LeBlanc, Larry McDougal, Steve Prescott, Jeb Rebner, and Ron Spencer making art for this book. It's fantastic. Here's one picture on the screen right now. Uh, hopefully, Kyle, you've had this up while we've been talking. Yeah, I have it up. And part of me is thinking, should I post the images in this video? And part of me is thinking, should I encourage you to go get the Ratkin book for your own damn self? And you look through the pictures and you see how cool this artwork is. Because, holy shit, I love it when you do this kind of art style. I love it when it's like this really gritty, thick, outline, dark, shaded kind of artwork. And it fits so well with the Ratkin. I'm all here for it. Yeah, it looks super gnarly. It's It looks like something you'll find on an album cover. It's fucking awesome. Now for the actual history. We have a real creation story with this. Uh, they don't talk about the triads. They don't really seem to care that much about the triad because they don't begin the story with the creation story. They do bring up the weaver and the worm and the strife between the two. But it's not that big of a thing. So... The Ratkin were created to kill. Not originally. All the changing breeds were being given their different role. The Ratkin were, I do believe, the dead last breed to be created by Gaia until the Kitsune were made years down the road. But we're not talking about the foxes today. And Gaia's looking around saying, okay, you're my memory, you're my voice, you're my warrior, uh, you're my tricksters. She's given out all these gifts and realizes, oh, we don't have anything for the rat. Um, okay, uh, stay right there, rats. I'm going to get something for you. And that guy is like digging through her bookcase and her trunk and her shelves, trying to find something to give to the rats. And she's thinking, well, shit, I really don't have anything to give to the rat king now, do I? She's thinking about it, tapping her foot, saying, I got to half ass something together. That turns out the worm has decided for you what the gift is going to be. The worm is going around teaching humans how to build weapons, how to hunt hunters, the the predator animals that should be hunting you. You can hunt them instead. And Gaia realizes that this is going to be a problem. So instead of, oh, I don't know, giving these over to your warriors, the Garu, to handle, you instead gave them over to the Ratkin. Where she says, rats, I want you to go around and I want you to kill humans if they become too numerous and you will be my warders of men. And the Ratkin say, sounds good. And how do they do it? Well, they begin with the Impergium. And we all know what this event is by this point, right? Yeah, go kill all the humans. It'll be fun, I promise. Now, the Ratkin join the Thorfangs and the Red Talons in doing this. They have a new toy to use. Legs. Oh... So, you know how the worm tends to use diseases? The Ratkin were the ones who pioneered spreading a disease that kills a ton of people. The worm looked at that and said, huh, I can do that too, and he starts copying the Ratkin. Uh, the rats go around and actually confirm the kills of the humans that they go after, because once you spread the plague, you just need one rat in the middle of a city, you need to flick one flea onto one guy, and then that's it. Everything solved itself because there was no quarantining back then, there were no real medical practices. There was no sanitation. So if a rat king got a hold of you, you died. There was no saving you. And the rat king are trying to kiss up to Garu saying, hey, we're like murder buddies, right? Uh, murder buddies, let's do it. And the Garu pushed the rat king away saying, fuck you, this is our operation. And the rat king will say, well, fuck you too. And the two end up butting heads for years and years. They, they're not getting along. And what happens... Uh, Really, this happened before, but the Ratkin want to talk about it now. The Ratkin play the he said, she said game and say it was the Weaver's fault. It's the Weaver's fault that the worm went insane. It's the, the Weaver was the aggressor in it the entire time. But you're not entirely wrong with saying that, but at the same time, the worm took it too far. Well, yeah, I thought and, they had that compromise where, like, you know, the Weaver, or like the Weaver and the Worm agreed 100 years, and I'll let you have the first time. And then the Weaver went, okay, cool, and spend these first hundred years learning how to bind you where you are so you can't take over the world. Yeah, ac the according, yeah like, accor according to the Weaver, uh, according to the Ratkin, they say that the Weaver didn't even agree to a compromise at all. She just immediately went for binding. Then tried to do the exact damn same to the to the Wild. The Wild managed to escape. The Ratkin saw that and said, we really hate the Weaver. 
because the weavers going after the humans and showing them what things are supposed to be and giving stuff names. So they ran over and decided that they were going to ally themselves with the wild. And then, boom, that's where they get most of their gifts from. Wild spirits. And in case you want to know why the Ratkin are so fucking crazy, it's because they're talking to the wild all day. That yeah, we we know that from the uh, from the live play at least. As we, as we know with the Ratkin, when you tried negotiating with them, they were the most unreasonable people possible. Along with that, a lot of them were nutters, and that's why it's because they're in direct communion with the wild. Which is Storm was fighting a losing battle then. No, and along with that, the wild will give you such like crazy out the ass regeneration. And with the Gorgons, as it was described in Possession, oh, that book was only a chip at the tip of the iceberg because the wild is the force of evolution, dude. It can just give you new stuff at random. So, stuff that's, list that's listed in Gorgons, uh, the Gorgon section of Possessed, it's cool, but of 3.5, I'm giving Gorgons like psychic powers and stuff like that. Like You can see like the past, present, and future at the same time. And like have like the mind flare, the ill fit mental blast as a power. That's the kind of stuff that the wild can give you. Uh, yeah, you wake up the next day, you have three arms and, an, and another leg growing out of your ass. Why? Because fuck you. Because that's a Ra Chernobyl. Yes. Right can also have gone to flux before the realm of the wild. And you guys remember Limbo from D and D? Vaguely. Yes. It's an eternal white plane. The minute somebody steps in it and thinks, the realm will begin to shift and bend to their thoughts, causing more thoughts, causing more reality-changing events, thus creating a constant cycle of change where nothing stays consistent. The wild realm is like that, Flux. But the wild's brain is in there, and of course we established that the wild is fucking crazy, so imagine what that realm looks like. It's constant chaos. Nothing there makes sense. I'm trying to think of like you guys remember like Spongebob where like the Flying Dutchman had the fly of despair and drop Squibbert into it. That that's what that looks like. Gotcha. Interesting. <laughs> the only thing I can and, think of is someone going in thinking, being like, Oh, the world's gonna end. Oh no, and then the world ends. Then the world ends, and then like and then the big crunch happens and big bangs all over again, and then behold yeah. that's that's the constant state of flux. Stuff is just constantly being made. And Speaking of stuff being made uh, in evolution, the rat can fail to evolve in something. You know delirium, where if somebody sees you in your cross form, they tend to uh, form a memory hole to cope with seeing you, something that shouldn't exist. Rat can fail to develop that because well, they're killing humans, and a human doesn't get to, to form the genetic memory to pass on to other people. Ratkin cross form will cause delirium, a, a very small version of like like it's difficulty five to avoid going into delirium when you see a ratkin. So this leads to a lot of veil breaches. I uh, you can as you can imagine. Yes. And what happens next? The uh, War of Rage, and of course we have the two different stories as to how that start. It could be the Ananasi um, were found out as enemies of the wild. That the Giru have aligned themselves with to fight the worm, which led to a massive misunderstanding with the Macaulay, who refused to actually listen to what the Giru had to say, or it was caused over a girl being killed by a sore fang, whichever story you want to go with. Ratkin sided with the Pharah, because if the if the Giru are not going to listen to what we have to say, then we're just going to force them to listen to us. And of course, this fails miserably, because even though they're pack animals, uh, I guess the Giru, you're, you're not going to win that fight. Yeah. No. Werewolves are fucking strong. Along with that, um, compare 9 foot to 10 foot tall wolf to 5 foot or 6 foot tall rat. Yeah, it's boot between their pads. You're well out of your weight class with that regard. And this was before their favorite weapon, the gun, was invented. So you had no real chance against this. Causing, well, even though they had plagues on their side, and bloodborne pathogens, and venereal diseases, it wasn't enough because you were up against the, the people that don't have sex for pleasure and actually kept themselves clean to get a Fenris who beat their asses and then forced the Ratkin into a state of surrender. Dream is dead. That, that kill all humans dream is dead. 
And once again, another W on part of the Geru, because it actually turns out that was that was probably for the best, because if the Ratkin had their way, there probably wouldn't be any Hamids for any changing breed if they if they succeeded. And then we'd all be in the same boat as the Red Talons. And then the Ratkin decided that we're going to try again. It's not going to be today. It's not going to be tomorrow. We're going to do this eventually. They spread out all across the world start forming these little sleeper agent camps. They say, one day, when time is right, we're going to release this deadly plague or this massive curse that's going to kill all of humanity, and then we will succeed our job that Gaia has given us, and we will um, save the world by killing everybody on the world. Perfect, right? Bit of a counterintuitive plan, but, you know, go off. Let them cook. It kind of makes me... It kind of makes me wish that the the uh, bomb um, was a judgment apocalypse had a scenario for the other fair breeds because the right kin, what they're doing is essentially what the pure are doing. Uh, the the gif and risk that fall to the worm. They're you're purifying the world by ending all of existence. So um are we sure that the rats aren't actually aligned with the worm instead? I mean, horseshoe theory, horseshoe theory is in full effect here. You became so wild, you looped around to being wormish. Well, yeah, they the Rackin <laughs> don't really create anything. They just kill. Therefore, you've already... You're, the game is rigged from the start. Yeah. And the fun thing is, is that the Rackin have already considered the apocalypse as... Um, it's already started. It started during the Concord, the year 5000 BC. And the Guru decided... They were going to um, stop trying to kill off humanity and form tribes, and you had groups like the Children of Gaia, the Glasswalkers, the Black Furies, uh, decide that they're going to defend humans and help them prosper. And the rat can say, the humans are the tool of the worm, who have just surrendered everything to the worm. The apocalypse has started. So, um... Thank you, Ratkin, for proving that the Red Talons were right, as the Red Talons always are. Uh, fifth edition did it, and now the Ratkin did it. So, uh, Kyle, there's nothing morally wrong with the Ratkin. I have two sources saying that, uh, with the Red Talons. Okay. And? Uh, it, it proves that um, going Red Talon full Doomer is actually the, the optimal way of play. Uh, well, that's the only way to play. Kind of cringe, not gonna lie. <laughs> And that's where the history ends in the Ratkin book, but you may be noticing. That was really short. It seems that this followed like the more along the lines of like first editions philosophy, where I don't really know when these books were written because the release dates don't really reflect when these were when these projects started. But you're missing a lot of history. So thankfully we have other books that I can pull information from and I can finish the Ratkin story through that. I have no idea why they stopped that. Well, actually, no, I, I do know why they started that early. Um, it's because the rest of the Ratkin books is um, entirely mechanics. I mean, this this book has got a ton of mechanics in it. Uh, as we can talk about aspects real quick, there are eight auspices the Ratkin. Why? Eight auspices. There are they're not called. On. They're not called auspices. They're called aspects. Because Luna likes you, but not enough to give you powers based off the phase of the moon. Hmm. Instead, it's like a D and D class. Like you choose what you want to be in the Ratkin, and then that you starts affecting to. you mentally and allows you to access different gifts. Shall we go into a detail with the aspects during a brief intermission with um with uh history? Yeah, <laughs> sure. Yep. So, I told Ryan, do, do not pull up a, a gift for every aspect, because we're going to be here all damn day talking about gifts. Yeah. I, I, I was tempted to, but I only chose the eight. Okay. There are... I lost them. There are, <laughs> about, <laughs> there, there are four good ones, and then four bad ones. There, there's technically a fifth bards, but they all died during the War of Rage, and nobody wants to be a bard anymore. Uh, you, those were those were like the, the happy galliards, and nobody wants to be happy anymore in the Ratkin. So we so, have... Uh, uh, Ryan, you were saying? 
Oh, uh, go ahead. I I was I was uh, just go ahead. We have the knife skulkers. They are they're kind of like the philodox. If the philodox was angry all the damn time and decided uh, instead of having a trial for you, I'm just going to skip to the execution. We okay. have the sh- we have the shadow seers, which are the dark theurge. Imagine the theurge as like uh, if we're talking about like Final Fantasy white mage. This is like a full, fully steeped black mage, like like fully destructive kind of spells with with the shadow seers. Shadow wizard money uh, gang, we love casting spells. See the tunnel runners, where they are directly. I mean, this is one word difference from the gutter runners from Warhammer. I mean, these are rats going around in sewers looking for people to stab to death. That's what they are. And the funny thing is, is that they're the most sensible ones because they have the lowest level of rage. So you can reason with a tunnel runner. You can't reason with anyone else. That's a bit ironic how that works. Next up, the warriors. Where, uh, well, guess what they are? Arun. No, warriors. Yeah, no, I'm it's, sorry, it's, they're paladins. It's, it's <laughs> in the name. Yeah, this is um, this is your D and D fighter. They're also known as the blade slaves, as you... in how a warrior works is that they are expected to fight and die for the ratkin, <laughs> because as we know, rats breed like cl- crazy. You want to talk about rabbits breeding? Nah, it's the rats that do it. A rat in nature lives for about two years. They have litter and litter of rats. Uh, with the Ratkin, that goes from a two-year lifespan to a 90-year lifespan. Good lord. Oh, you can just throw enemies, you can just throw your own rats at the wall forever, and that's what the warriors are. They're pretty much, they're pretty much our jihadis at the end of the day. You're Sun never sets on a rat empire. Yeah, you're fully expected to die fighting for the wild, and that that's a death that's worth dying. Of course. So, Sit there clinking that's bottles on the side of a in the side of a car, going warriors, come out and play. <laughs> eh? <laughs> We've got what? four freak aspects, by the way. Too are these are the guys that have gone uh, I- I- insane, and these are these are aspects that form with rats that live in the umbra, or you're in direct communion with the wild who wants you to follow these things. It's the wild who's given you this idea. They are the engineers. You might think, doesn't that sound kind of normal? Uh, no, because they're obsessed with building guns and swords. As in, this kind of weapons they build is the shotgun that has six revolving barrels in it that shoots two slugs at the same time. See, that just sounds or, cool. Or the the table saw uh, great axe, where you take a table saw and put five other saws in it, and then have it on a massive stick, I mean, just, and it's designed solely for slamming it down onto the heads of giant Fomori and just splattering blood and gore everywhere. Those are the kind of weird-ass weapons that they build. Remind me again why we aren't working a bit more closely with them. That sounds awesome. Because they're crazy! I think we could they're use bastard. a little crazy right now. They also have the Munchmousen. They're, um, they're pirates. I mean, that's literally what they are. They're, they're pirates. Yar har. As in, like, the Somalian pirates who are going around and shooting wow. you to death with AK-47s. Okay. Uh, next up, Plague Lords. Uh, you get one guess as to what they do. Uh, kill, kill, they're man, best. thing, cough, cough, plague, die. Yes. And next up, you have the Twitchers. They're... Uh, they're there is one rat... Um, they're addicted to crack. Can, uh, yeah, uh, I'm not thinking like Ike Claw. I'm thinking of Rot the Unclean. That's who I'm thinking. Um, let me get this picture for you. Uh, it, I don't have Warhammer uh, Total War, but if I were to play as this game, it would be as this guy. Uh, these are warriors who have lost their damn minds. Uh, they, uh, this is the kind of soldier that goes around and kills its own men. Just because it thinks uh, everyone around it is the worm sometimes. Like, sometimes they lose touch with reality and go onto frenzies. So and, they're coronates. Yeah, like, uh, pretty much Karn from uh, Warhammer 40k. Uh, here's what Throt looks like, by the way. I posted them in game chat. Game chat, okay. And that's also I mean, what look, a Twitcher would look like with the, he the does third look arm. Looking. 
You got all these. Kind of looks like uh, a choker from uh, Vermintide. <clears throat> yeah, it's probably oh, well, what it is. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ryan. You you do know about Warhammer. I played a lot of uh, Vermintide. It's pretty fun. I, I, I'm a Dark Tide kind of guy myself. And by a lot, yeah. I think I mean like so many Games. hours. Take a drink. Ah, oh, shit! Splash water in my face. I. History that is missing. We can talk about that now. So, where did the Bonars come in? Well, the Bonars were spreading across the entire world because of that massive refugee crisis, thanks to Assange Striders losing their land to set. Um, Ratkin decided we're going to follow them. And then Rat says, wait, hold on a minute, guys. I got this idea. Rat approaches the Bonars and says, would you like me to be your totem? Because it doesn't look like you have anyone else can fill the role of a totem. I mean, if a spirit comes out of the woods uh, and, like, wasp, for example, and says, I'm going to be your totem, it's going to be pretty weak. Me, I'm already coming out the gate strong because I have an entire changing breeds to my name. Follow me, I can give you immediate power. And the Bonars are swayed by Rat, and behold, that's how the totem edge starts. You have Rat double-dipping between Guru and Ratkin. So, Rat's strong as hell, thanks to that deal. Or just that, that, that one tribe pushed him over the edge to being probably toe-to-toe -to -toe with Wendigo in terms of power. You're scary motherfuckers. And, of course, wherever the Bonars go, the Ratkin follow them. There is a merit you can take with the Bonars. It's a level 3 merit where Ratkin, like, uh, like a pack of 7 Ratkin, Will just follow you for the entire game and they won't be in a scene until uh, you're in trouble. But the minute the Bonar gets in trouble, all the Ratkin will swarm whoever's causing them trouble and more than likely kill them. Going to run back into wherever they were hiding out of the scene. Seems kind of busted. Well, granted, you might not want that person to die because once again, you can't reason with the rat. That's, That's fair. And remember that thing we talked about with the Bonars, the Ban of Man? Ratkin invite the Bonars over and say, we're going to create something called the Band of Men. You're noticing that Anne is going to warp itself a lot. And you have the Crusades, the 100 Years War, uh, the uh, everything going on in China around this time. So we have a new plan. We're going to wait for humanity to kill itself. And then we'll just reap the benefits. And uh, we're just going to wait for the issue to solve itself. We're going to accelerate it a little bit. Stuff like Spanish flu, mad cow disease, malaria, Ebola virus, chlamydia. Those are all inventions of the Ratkin. What about COVID? We're probably going to have to add that word out. <laughs> I said I said it with a B. It's a different thing. I, I hope um, I hope um, censors are able to you know, get there being funny. but um, No, it's AI. Much, I'll and, fuck with it. Uh, pretty much all these um, massive plagues are invented by the rats. And the rats will spread them during times of war in order to accelerate the human tragedy. Uh, when, when you say the disease, we're just like, put like a, like a crow call uh, in, in, in that section. Have, yeah, I'll, I'll get it like a stock crow sound effect. <laughs> Next up you have, this is actually a fun bit of history. Grandfather Thunder comes into the picture. You remember him, the big damn guy in the sky that the Shadow Lords talk to? Yes. Of course. He, he comes down, and his Shadow Lords catch on that the Ratkin are making plagues. Shadow Lords capture a group of Ratkin and drag them back into their cairn, lock them up and say, you now work for us. You're going to make plagues for us. And then when we need a bioweapon, we're going to call you to release it. <laughs> Classic Shadow Lords trying to make the world a shittier place. Oh, behold, that's the next thing you got. Um, so World War One with the release of Spanish Flu, that was definitely a collaboration between the Shadow Lords and the Ratkin when it came to that. And next up, um, Pan. Have Ratkin in Japan, and they're known as the Nezumi, N E Z U M I. That's how you spell it. Uh, who are more chill than your average Ratkin because not that much happened around Japan. 
granted, the Japanese all stuck to themselves. Uh, that country is known for its uh, love of foreigners, right? And its um, uh, intense um, uh, leaning towards uh, everybody being introverted. Um, yes. They were, wearing, uh, they, were, they were all wearing face masks before the pandemic started. And, of course, because nothing violent ever happens in Japan, right, can are pretty chill. Of course, uh, that's until the Bakumatsu period, where you have my favorite period of Japanese history. Uh, so many good shows come out around that time. And eventually, we can't be shoguns anymore. We gotta do what um, the Emperor says now. Right. Uh, the Ratkin aren't happy about that because now globalization's taking effect, but are still chill in comparison to the other Ratkin. Right. And, of course, there a lot of them are wiped out during the War of Shame, and a few of them start talking t too closely to the Kuei Jin, uh, resulting in the Ratkin of that area being killed by the Makole and the Naga. Of course, they never got to see the Naga and report about it because they, they were dead before they hit the ground. <laughs> The snakes yeah. After them. yeah, we already talked about the Naga being extra sneaky. And what else happens <clears throat> after that? Well, um, the French Revolution happened, uh, along with the American Revolution before that, and the Russian Revolution after that. And the Bonars fought in all three, the Ratkin fought alongside them. And they thought it was really funny seeing all this death and decay going on. They thought it was really funny watching the British die. They thought it was really funny when uh, France found the chaos. And they thought it was really funny when the... Um, Turns out that communism wasn't that good of an idea, but the Russians did anyway, and then all the chaos happened in Russia. Like, wow, and these people are this this whole ban of man thing is going really well for them. We should just sit back and we don't even need plagues. We just let them do this to each other. Out for the big parts. The nineteen forties roll around and the glass workers are about to collapse because they're worshiping city fathers. And the worship of different city fathers is causing the glass workers, uh, known in the spirit as the Iron Riders, to go to civil war with itself, resulting in the complete collapse of the tribe, where Cockroach had to come back from space, tear his clan back from the hands of Starbridge Lion, and reestablish control as the glass workers. And well, what about the City Fathers? I'm glad you asked because the Ratkin go over to the City Fathers and take them as their totems. And now you've got all these different city spirits that are giving gifts to the rats, making it easier and easier for the rats to operate in urban environments. So, thanks to that, thanks to Cockroach not covering up that loose end, every city has a ratkin presence. Every major metropolitan city has a ratkin presence. Atlanta, Philadelphia, New York City, Boston, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Paris, France, London, England, Berlin, Germany, all of them have gigantic nests of ratkin um, that they will never get rid of because of that. <laughs> Damn good deal, once again. And lastly, clear bombs. Ratkin want them. The minute they get their hands on dirty bombs, or eventually the creation of the plague bomb, they're going to detonate those. There's no question about that. They see nothing wrong with going nuclear. Uh, if they had their hands on dirty bombs already... They would destroy the planet at this point. <laughs> well, yeah, but then they would immediately fall to the worm after using them. Uh, you, once again, you became so wild, you shoot around. Accidentally became the worm. The, <laughs> the Ratkin aren't very smart, are they? You, you know what? We can actually do like a, like a fair breed versus um, vampire for this one. This sounds like a lot like the Setites, doesn't it? A little bit. Except less, less rapey, but yes. Because Ryan... Uh, in about the Setite episode because you're absent for that. Yes. That tried making a church to fight the worm. But ended up falling so deep into his zealous um, countercultural beliefs against the worm that he ended up becoming one of the worm's greatest assets. Interesting. Yeah, the Setites just, just decided to drag more people into sin and depravity to the point and the worm's like, Oh, cool! People ruining their lives with sin, sex, drugs, and and, and murder. Yeah, what what does fucking children and doing fentanyl have to do with fighting the demiurge? Uh, I don't know. We've just been doing this for so long, we can't stop. Can't stop, won't stop. <clears throat> In my D cart right now. <laughs> oh, you go you go on to took too much subreddit. You'll have a great time. Yes, and. 
That's it with history. How about culture? Do rats have culture? Uh, yes, as the Rat Utopia experiment showed. As we know, once again, like the rats will become homosexual if they have no women to mate with because the alpha rats keep them all for themselves. And some rats will become actively psychopathic, and some rats will just become somnambulists who want to be left alone. It's a lot like that with the ratkin, but majority of them tend to be violent psychopaths. Um, with the ratkin women, don't be a ratkin woman, because if you get selected to be a breeder, that's what you're expected to do forever. There are ratkin who are designated mothers. Where the current alpha will have her down, like either physically strapped to, or she's so morbidly obese that she can't get up anymore. And they will just use her as a breeding slave to make ratkin after ratkin after ratkin, and that's her life. It's kind of like the uh, the mothers from uh, from Mad Max Fury Road, basically. It's exactly that. And you can just uh, imagine um, how rough nest society can be. That, that's what they call their seps, uh, seps, by the way. They call it a nest. Um, that gives me the same kind of image as a hive, right, with, with the Black Sparrow dancers. Yes. Uh, they do have nests in the Umbra and in the wilderness, but majority of these are in cities. Yeah, that, that makes again, sense. Most of that game with New York City and the Rat Czar, I had to like make it somebody's job to be the head exterminator of all rats. Yeah, well, um, th- that that's just New York. Of course, what the rat can all want is the death of all humans. So... Instances of gun violence, diseases breaking out in the street, um, houses catching fire, gas leaks. It's all the rat can cause in that. It's their small attempts to try to kill humanity. The worm wants to corrupt you. The worm will just get you to be complacent sheeple that are stuffing your face with otollies, watching Action Bill every day on your uh, TV, listening to Red News Network, uh, getting completely pumped up with whatever Magadon is giving you. And... Ratkin uh, just want to kill you. So that actually goes against the worm because that's one less Fomori that gets to serve in the in the worm's army. Well, yes, but then, you know, once you kill enough people to the point where it starts tearing the neighborhood apart, that becomes a breeding, a breeding ground for Banes. Exactly. You cause enough chaos, <clears throat> eventually you're going to draw the attention of the calamity worm. Yeah, that's the thing about uh, chaos. is like, if you go too far chaos, it just turns into Darwinism, and then somebody stronger than you is going to come over and just take over everything. Oh, yeah. And Absolutely. who... Who uh, lives with the Ratkin? The Ratkin are all homeless. They instead squat in houses and tend to squat in Bonar cairns. You want to go hang out with the Bonars, there is a Ratkin somewhere in that cairn set or protectorate, and they're not leaving. And they're going to call their friends, and eventually that place is going to be filled with ratkin until they throw themselves at the worm and die fighting the worm. And the vicious cycle repeats all over again. So, um, Squat in the house, call friends, all the garo go get themselves killed in a fight, stay, keep the cam for yourself, profit. So, Ryan, you're thinking about playing a Bonar come Rage Cross Appalachia, right? Uh, I can, absolutely. That if, if you go with that idea, you're going to have to constantly look over your shoulder and make sure the damn rats aren't following you. And I haven't seen all that right, many uh, rats in Fairmont, in all honesty. And, and then Kyle will say, like, every now and then you see, like, behind behind, where, like, a rat peeks out from behind a tree and then hides right behind it. Depending on which way you go, uh, you may encounter more or less rat kin. Uh, just look at hard enough into a garbage can, eventually you'll find one. Yeah. Like I said, yeah, I've been there a number of times. I've I've never really seen a rat there. Uh, step into a Popeyes, you'll find one there. Rock and roll McDonald's. <laughs> and as for the society, where we already went into detail about that, they have alphas, they have elders. Or the angriest and the craziest gets to rule. Great combination, right? Uh, you know what? It feels like we got something in common with these people. Say when uh, every like hundred or so rats, there is a designated warlord. A warlord is a rat that has a company of one hundred rats that goes into battle and tears shit up um, in regards to the worm. You also, have for every one hundred rats a mystic who is a head dark priest of the ratkin. 
a very fun roles you get to have um, if you're doing a whole Ratkin related game. And mm. as for courts and politics, well, they're um, most of their politics go around um, in kind of circle as orc politics do in Warhammer. Uh, I'm the biggest, I'm the best, I'm the strongest, so I get to be the king. So we get to bragging about the boss. And they say throughout tradition, a rat king, which is what they call the leader of their nest, holds periodic feasts to address the needs of the populace. Uh, so this is actually like the smartest rat at the same time. And they'll look around and they'll pretend to be a sore fang for a day before going right back to killing and pillaging the worm. Yeah. Uh, and back in the Middle Ages, they used to be a little bit more sophisticated, but with the rise of the Anthropocene era, manners and pretending to be intelligent has gone right out the window. We just want to kill people. Well, at least they're honest. And as for everything else, I think that's about it in terms of culture. I'm looking through the book, making sure I didn't miss anything. Also, details um, at Ken around the world. Uh, guess what country doesn't have rats in it? Uh, Antarctica. None of them, except for Antarctica. Yep. You can't have anything in Antarctica. Uh, maybe some, I don't know, Rokay, I guess. Until, uh, until the wild creates the were penguin, it will have no presence in Antarctica. That would be kind of funny, though. A the were wild can do it. He just, a were wild can do it. He, just saying, um, I'm not going to do it because the weaver's just going to find a way to kill it again. Like well, the, then do better. Like with the rare insects. I mean, you have the power to do it, you just choose not to. Um, on top of that, Ryan, <clears throat> the realms. The realms. Realms. Over seven realms. There are seven realms. Uh, tell us about the realms, because I sent you the pages of the realms. There are many weird <laughs> realms, such as the Paradise Realms. Little pockets that the Ratkin will make for themselves in the Umbra. So this is a hammer space dimension that they build. They will leap into and then live inside of. That's why if you thought you killed all the Ratkin, you didn't. Do you have the key to the Paradise Realm? No! Only the rats do. I like how they use a, uh, a quote from uh, Charlotte's Web, the movie. <laughs> a fair is a veritable Smorgasbord, Borgasbord, Orgasbord, after the day is done. <laughs> I love All the right. fucking dialogue in this. So, See, in Paradise so, Realms, you've got Rat Kingdoms, Rat Alleys, and. Yeah, rat Kingdoms and Rat Alleys. Mm -hmm. uh, rat Kingdoms, uh, they. Well, John, you cut you cut out for a sec, there. I cut out for a second. Yeah, were you gonna yeah. say something? Word you're looking at is Munch Mousin. Oh well, yeah, no, no, I, I, I know what it was. Uh, yeah. I just heard you say say something, but yeah. it cut out. Munch no, don't often worry about it. have <laughs> uh, elaborate stories of spirit realms that defy all logical explanation. Their lost realms are often imaginary, or at least mythical. Rodent storytellers repeat fantastical stories of these realms again and again. The most common tale of this type is told by unearthly Ratkin, who have lost his kingdom in the depths of the Umbra. Sadly, a few of these legends have at least some basis in fact. Rat kingdoms are similar to Paradise realms, Oh, they're two different things. Don't worry too much about it, because the Paradise Realm, like, uh, the Rat Kingdom is a specific kind of realm, but you have small ones like the Colosseum, which is this massive sex orgy of blood and gore. The Carnival, which is a, well, guess what that is, that's an internal carnival. Yeah. And the Bubo, which is, um, pretty much looks one for one like the, like the Gardens of Nurgle from Warhammer 40k. Yeah, uh, I don't want to see how they fertilize like, that garden. I don't either. Yes. <laughs> the thought terrifies me. So yeah, you were saying you were saying about the rat kingdoms. Yeah. See, I thought I thought rat kingdoms were part of the paradise realms, but that 
Oh, oh yeah, it's, it's, completely it's, like, it's like a subcategory. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, blah, 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 blah. Rat kingdoms are similar to paradise realms, but typically created around the dementia of a single were-rat. Through storytelling, uh, through enough storytelling, an unearthly were-rat can attempt to make even the most imaginative realm become real. Many Munchausen quests to recover these lost realms. Some will typically bring a rat pack along to confirm its existence and speak it back into the spirit world. A few have rapturous visions of their lost realms or can return to their personal paradises only in dreams. The details of these realms always correspond with the psychological embellishment of the were-rats who speak of them. Whether they actually exist is another matter entirely. From there, we go uh, into... The realm of mental illness. <laughs> That's what it's it The Malkavians, is. basically. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> It, it's uh, the uh, fuck Malkavian. It's the Madness Network. Where we're at? See. Yeah. <laughs> uh, moving right. on into the Rat Alley. The rat alleys. Rat alleys are a recurrent uh, and are recurrent and dangerous a spiritual phenomenon. Uh. Spiritual phenomenon umbral travelers can use to their own advantage. A rat can, can gain access to these spirit realms through any of the seediest, the most dangerous alleyways on Earth. Pools of rainwater and less identifiable fluids reflect the illumination street lamps and neon lights, providing the focus required for any shape changer to step sideways. Particularly mystical rat kin can lead other supernatural creatures or even humans into the spirit world for a short while. This provides one of the deadliest traps the werewolves were rats can devise. Rat alleys are always found accidentally. A storyteller may ask a character to roll Nolsis difficulty nine. Holy fuck. That's fucking that's that's uh, a that's a that's a tight trap there. Uh, yeah. If there's a chance of uh, an alley forming nearby, uh, some mystics believe that all manifestations of rat alleys are connected somehow. And that if a well-traveled mystic can find out how to leap between them, the rat can travel around the world in a heartbeat. Unfortunately, the few shadow seers who have managed to make any progress in, their re in this research have all mysteriously disappeared while trying. Can you take stairway worms? I'm getting bombarded with messages. At stairway worms, I can blow through this. Now you may be thinking some nights, oh, my house is haunted. I hear creaking. I hear wailing. I hear hot air expanding my walls. As it turns out, no, it's not a ghost. You just got rats. Four. Um, pretty much these are made by tunnel runners who are building a small realm inside the walls of your own home so they can kill you. If too many umbral travelers pass through the same human habitation, it's not unusual for the dimensions to expand and the house begins to distort. If you begin to see weird things breaking in your house, the ratkin are going to kill you any day now. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's pretty fun. If enough, if enough ratkins swarm into a stairway alley well, um, stairway realm, they may even take up residence in there. Lost Ratkin may join them, setting up an otherworldly nest not far from where the humans re usually reside. On the rare occasion where humans like to muck about with such things, uh, going into their crawl spaces, checking out their attic, your delirium will kick in, making the experience more traumatic for everyone. Children have been known to get lost in the stairway realms. A fortunate few are captured and raised by the Ratkin afterward. The next time you hear a strange groan of wood beneath your stairs, say a little prayer and hope the nearest boat hole is working properly. Is the basically uh, just gonna the, fuck the up Macaulay hole. Culkin in you in your own home? Yeah. The bolt hole. Uh, that's uh, the little portals they have. Ah, uh, okay. And next, and next up, the television zone. We have the, the theme song of Itchy and Strixy. They they fight and fight and fight and fight and fight. 
Yep. Jesus. But you may be wondering, what's on TV? Turn it on, there's rats. <laughs> now, now this one's funny. I want this one right out in its entirety. <laughs> All right. So, uh, uh, should, one should, of the... should I do a paragraph and you do a paragraph? Yeah, we, absolutely. We each can do one. Uh, who uh, goes like first, me or you? Four or five. Uh, you can. Uh, yeah. Which one do you want to do? Yeah. See, I, I'll I'll go first. All right. One of the most unusual realms beyond the Velvet Shadow is a dimension devoted entirely to the human memories of television programs, the Television Zone. Since memories of TV programs have thoroughly infiltrated the collective unconscious of the human race, the various rooms of this zone contain elements that m of many popular programs, past and present. Right spirits travel freely in the walls of between dimensions, <laughs> and this zone is no different. Uh, you can look up more details about this in the Umbra book, but we're not talking about the Umbra book today. One particular section has been... Okay, blah, 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 blah. All right, Ryan, you go. Where rats know it as the itchy zone. Oh. <laughs> that sounds like, uh, sounds like a personal problem. Uh, in this a, a violent arena, what? Yes. Cartoon characters are locked in eternal conflict. Cats and rats fight epic battles for animated houses using everything from kitchen knives to catapults to fight their skirmishes. Rat spirits and rat kin alike have begun to make regular trips to this realm, learning ingenious new tricks to use in the war against order. Uh, Rodentia ephemera, who make their home yeah, that's right. here, have learned ways to alter their spirit forms to help them wage warfare in this dimension. The appendix one for more details on itchy form. What the hell is that? The, the, your itchy form, which is your your the cartoon within you, where sometimes you're in the you're in the umbra and you want to shift to your cross form, you end up looking like a demented cartoon character instead of an actual giant rat. You get to actually just become Jerry from Tom and Jerry. <laughs> exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so once again, a combination of gently disturbing and stupid. Well, yeah, that's, that's what the rat can do best, it seems. Dumb. So, you... oh, go ahead. You were saying? Oh, I was just going to continue saying. reading. All right. Uh, continue reading, and then I'll take um, continue reading until the bottom of the page, and then I'll take over. All right. Uh, some demented uh, Rodentia ephemera have even started to infest yes. areas associated with other television shows. A few shadow seers believe that if enough rat spirits invade an area associated with a program currently on the air, the show will either mutate terribly or suffer from horrible ratings until it dies. Uh... One a legion of rat spirits led by our precious young rodent, rodents, rodent, rodent rug rat, has begun to corrupt several current American children's shows, tormenting Teletubbies and purple dinosaur ranks among their favorite pastimes. Another swarm has developed an affinity for 50s family shows, infesting the spiritual reflections of places like Cleaver Household or Mr. Ed Barn, uh, Mr. Ed's Barn. Though this may sound strange, it may be hard to find a better explanation of the final episodes of many television programs. I guess. So, you want to know why the you want to know why the Simpsons suck? It's because of the Ratkin. I don't know. Super Eye Patch Wolf did a video not too long ago that like the most recent season of the Simpsons actually had some major yeah. staff changes, also, and it was actually good. He's also rubbing shoulders with Aaron Hansen now, which I'm not happy about one bit. <sighs> He's like he's like a uh, he's like a betentacled monster at this point. You started talking to Harris Brewis, which was already bad enough, and now you're talking to Heron Hansen. You are be you the start of poison has begun. It's the star of darkness. I fucking hate it when YouTubers uh, I, I really like end up hanging out with the wrong crowd. Yeah, it seems to happen to everybody this, nowadays. This, uh, this 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 is going to be a reflection of me when I'm like when I'm like a dad. And I don't like my kids' friends. Basically, yes. <laughs> and next up, you have 
unique spirits like the rat spirit. Um, guess what kind of spirit that is? That's a rat spirit. It's a mouse. Let's see, uh, so Ryan, you got your kangaroo rat, uh, yeah. your pack rat, your, your, your mole rat. rat. Yeah. Um, you got your, you got you got your pain rat. You got your disease rat. And then you got your anime rat. Uh, Kyle, you may think I'm taking a piss here. Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, Ryan, if you could read out the Freakachu. That's funny as Freakachu. shit. Freakachu. Uh, let me zoom in. Uh, Rage 2, Gnosis 9, Willpower 3, and the Power of Aries. This is an electronic rat spirit. A tiny critter with the affinity for the weaver that would put an engineer to shame. It breeds in complex electronic systems and takes on many of the characteristics of virtual pet gone bad. Anyone who owns an electronic device inhabited by the spirit becomes its owner or its victim, depending on your point of view. Freakachus, or freakus, uh, as they... What the fuck is that word? <laughs> <laughs> Colloquially? No. Colloqui Colloquially. Yeah. Co Colloquially? Yeah. Known. Are notoriously hard to kill, even in the spirit world, since they can hide in the smallest computer networks. Unlike its more sedate, mundane counterparts, the Freakachu has a repertoire of tactics for conditioning its owners. To the mundane, this manifests as Amusing technical glitches that can only be solved by unusual methods. Really, the computer likes it when I sing. That's really is, fucking uh, scary. I'm going to close well, that tab. For <laughs> the spiritually aware, the critter, uh, the critter will appear on a television or a computer screen taunting its owner. As the name suggests, it will freak at you until it gets what it wants. Uh, Freakachus all the have... All the screamer images. <laughs> hey, Freakachu, meet my friend Magnet. <laughs> Fuck yeah. you. How about no? I just saw what was in history pages. I put that up for like a couple seconds. I was looking at it like, that's really freaky. I'm taking that down. Freakachus <laughs> have a love-hate relationship with Ratkin engineers. Their mood can make them boons or banes. A clever Ratkin, however, can nurture one of these little bastards into an electronic ally. When released into a computer network, the Freakachu can carry over a viral terrorism on command. Jesus Christ. I think we found the uh, solution to the TELUS problem. <laughs> there we go. Truly proficient so owners will train their Freakachu, uh, the Freakas to battle each other as they develop. Releasing them into contained computer networks surrounded by elaborate firewalls. Rackin engineers sometimes incorporate Freakachu events into their most popular aspect moods. So, um, so like that, like shit, that, that whole like shitty creepypasta image of like Squidward with like the bloody eyes. Yeah, <laughs> it's bad. all I'm thinking of. With it. <laughs> Fucking Sonic.exe up in here. Right. Yeah, so. Yeah, so all of like your like your shitty creepy pastas are written by the Ratkin, and they're making these pictures. Yes. <laughs> Jesus. That, that, that screamer image of like the car off in the distance. You're looking at the car, and then the zombie jumps out. Yeah, that that, that that sounds like that. And then behold, you get a virus after seeing that. Yeah, that sounds like a pain in the ass. I really don't want that. <laughs> See, you piss yourself, and then your computer gets fried. Let's talk about relationships. Yes, relationships time. Time for relationships. Yeah, time for relationships. Or relationships. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. with the relationships, they start off with the other Pharaoh breeds, starting with the Rokea. They've never met the Rokea. They have never met the Rokea. Uh,. I guess if you join a pack with a bunch of rat can Ronin, infest a big tramp steamer with some wave rats, maybe you'll run into one. Ask, ask me about something else. Moving on to the Noesha. 
they're shape-shifting coyotes with a funky sense of humor, and they don't take anything seriously. They kind of shotgun through a number of the uh, feral breeds. The Macaulay... They don't have much to say because they don't really talk to these guys so often. No, they don't. The Macaulay, uh, they probably know the truth about the Imperium about as much as the rat can do. Uh, the few that are left are really well hidden, uh, but they might just be shape-changing dinosaurs. They're giant pissed off shape changing dinosaurs uh the were foxes the kitsune they're also tricksters and they live in japan and they got seven tails go find a nizumi and figure out what the hell it is the garal uh they actually have an opinion on the garal they it's a damn shame what happened to them and they have a lot of potential to actually fix the earth if they could get their shit together uh as the book quotes if they don't wake up soon, they're probably going to sleep through the apocalypse and miss all the fun. The Garrow. You already know about them. Uh, they're the biggest hypocrites on the planet. All the suffering and misery is a result of their ill-conceived con- uh, concord. Thank you, Silver Fangs. And they keep acting like the saviors of the planet. Kill Garrow as an act of vengeance. It's a very easy way to, to get the infamy. Don't tell the boss that they told you that. Just kill the fucking Garrow. Uh, the Korax. Once again, continuing the continuing the trend of the Korax being the most based of everybody in the world of darkness. They love the Korax. They're thieves and deceivers. They like shiny things and they love secrets. They like them. But be very careful because they're incredible sc- spies and they have a habit of betraying basically any other pharaoh to get what they want. Um, next up, the Bastet. They fucking hate the Bastet. Because <laughs> they're cats. As they say, they're even more stuck up than the Garrow. They're pretentious. They're egotistical. And you need to fucking kick the shit out of them when you can. They also have this bad habit of claiming portions of the Umbra for themselves. And it's the main reason that the Rakan started hating them to begin with. They're entire, they're aloof, they're uptight, and they're uppity about their magic. And, me, and fucking up a Bastet is a very cheap way to get some infamy. Okay, moving on. It from, sounds like um, somebody's ass is chapped because you weren't the guys talking to Huitzilopochtli and learning his blood magic. Well, yeah. They should have gone to South... <laughs> Jesus Christ, what was that? <laughs> you got friggin' chewed. <laughs> what the fuck was that? <laughs> <laughs> that scared the shit out of me. What? Uh, well, what? What did you like? Like, like the Squidward picture? <laughs> I knew. I saw the Squidward picture. Why the? F- what was that? <laughs> Fuck's sake! That hurt. I have my headphones on. Uh, oh, okay. Anyway, moving on. The uh, Ananasi. Uh, the Squidward picture. <laughs> kind of glad I didn't hear it or see it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what the fuck that was. <laughs> but no, I, I saw the Squidward picture. It's it's right there on the fucking page there. It's still there in history pages. Anyway, uh, the Ananasi. They're were spiders. Are they weaver? Are they worm? They can't remember. They eat children and drink blood. Uh, there's something about them sharing their minds with the swarms of little spiders. They're even better at hiding than the rat can. Just don't think about it. Uh, the Ajaba. How the fuck do you know what the what the Ajaba are? They're hyenas. They eat carrion, so they're probably decent. We haven't met one of them. Uh, anyway, uh, let's talk about the Garrow some more. And they call over their friend, and Frankie calls over his friend Johnny to help out with it. Yeah, we got Frankie and Johnny versus, and they are two sides of the same coin. Basically, yes. Let's see, uh, Fra- Frankie, um is a tunnel runner and i think was it johnny versus is i'm going to assume he is a warrior yeah i think it i think it is i think he is yeah did you want to do uh, johnny or it. did you want to do frankie well given that he has the same name as me i'll do it okay you be johnny then all right okay uh, you got the black furies they're all women they're like like radical feminists and they're gay and uh and they got a weird idea about breeding. They like to kidnap men and like use them as a sperm daddies. And they have like an anger and management problem. Damn, Johnny. You yeah. got issues, don't you? Kid 
the Black Furies are all female, <laughs> and but that's about the only thing you could say is true for all of them. All I'm sure of is that they act like they got something to prove. That means it's really easy to push them into frenzy. What, what the hell is going on on your end? Are they coming in on my side, or...? Yeah, it's like every now and again, like, I'm getting, like, a massive clip of static, and then, like, your your audio will just randomly peak, like, a loud noise, like you're hitting your mic or something. I thought I was the only oh, one yeah, let me do hearing that. Yeah, I don't know what the hell that was. I don't know, that's what scared the shit out of me earlier. Because... Oh, okay, I thought I thought I was missing something. No, like, there was a really loud noise on my end, I don't know what happened to it. Alright, is this working now? Yeah, it's a little bit, it's a little bit choppy, but it's okay. Wait, hold on a minute. Uh, the jack is deployed plugged in. Okay, now is this working? Uh, I think. Alright. So, for some fucking reason, this is not coming through my actual headphones. I swear to God, we're going to get audio right eventually. That that microphone I ordered comes the 8th. Okay, cool. Uh, All right. Why the fuck is this not coming through my headphones? Yeah, it's still coming through your phone. I can hear it. Hang on, Matt. You keep going on with relationships. I'm going to disconnect and figure out what the fuck's going on with this. All right, cool. Uh, continue without me. All right. So, for the time being, we're going to talk about... Uh, so, yeah, we basically... If you go to a Black Fury, push them into a frenzy. Once they're, once they're pissed off, it's really easy to outsmart them. Make some smart ass remark about their riot girl combat boots. You know, have them swing it at anything. Right. Uh, move, moving on from that, we have the Bone Nars. Uh, they're nice guys once you learn to talk to them correctly. They don't all serve rat, but the ones that do will at least give you a chance to talk. The smart ones will even make a deal with you. Maybe instead of a contract, give grief to one of their elders. The, uh, the nicest ones show sympathy for other people starving on the street. So if you just go to them right, you'll be fine. And Johnny, to which replies, Are you kidding, Frankie? You can't trust them. They're Garrow. They're just like the rest of them. Sure, they're usually the victims of Garrow society, but that doesn't mean they won't stab you in the back just for some quick honor and glory. Street people are desperate, no matter what they really are. They're Garrow first, and servants are at second, if, if at all. They're kind of split on the Bonars. They're okay if they follow Rat. If they don't, they're just Garrow and will try to kill you. Uh, moving them. Fianna, uh, don't try to poison them. They drink stuff that would make Rat's piss taste like champagne. Not that I know that. Uh, but they're, <laughs> as the book remarks, they live up to all the worst stereotypes of their part of the world. Drunken fools, rowdy Ren Fair singers, and hot-tempered fighters. Amen. Uh, and now we get to talk about our boy. Our, our fucking boy. Uh, uh, sh no. What? Yeah, yeah, that's better. Okay. Now we All get right. to talk about the Geta Ferris. Uh, Frankie says, don't fight them unless you absolutely have to. It doesn't matter if you're dealing with a warrior or what, but they're, as the book reads, all dramatic head bashers and they love to kick your ass. They heard that in World War II, they fought on both sides just because the get got off on all the violence. That's true. They did. Sure. Okay. Um, the Glass Walkers. Another one where there's not a whole lot to go on with this one. They're a little too close to the Weaver. There isn't much wild left in them. They made more compromises with human civilization than any of the Garrow, so much so that not even the rest of the Garrow trust them. Pretty simple. Uh, the Red Talons. Uh, they're not half now, bad. Now you gotta admit, Frankie, these guys ain't half bad. This guy, you see, this guy's speaking my language here. Yeah, <laughs> Johnny <laughs> really is just you. <laughs> and now the Talons have this burning hatred for Manti, and you're usually just waiting for an excuse to sneak off and kill somebody. I, I wouldn't want to meet one in the woods, though. I, I hear they've got all sorts of dark rites they perform, and no one's around. Uh, even if it involves sacrificing humans, I I I I, I want to see it. I wouldn't want to meet one of those critters anywhere. Talons are even more vicious than the rest of the Garrow are, and they just as soon kill you as they look at you. I've seen a red talon chase down a whole rat pack just because they stole one of his fetish. I mean, what the hell? 
Yeah, so the well, red they like they're split on the red talons as well. Some of them some of them are okay with them, but they kind of freak them out and others are scared shitless about the red talons. What what I would love to know is how did you steal this the uh, the t- the talon or the fetish because the red talons use it with scars. Uh, I guess it's the back hand that dissolves human flesh. Probably, yes. So th- those are pretty hard to make. I would get one of those back too. Yes. Uh, and they do indeed torture people. They will cut you open, leave you in a forest, and pee on your wounds. Yeah. I'm going to pee on this man. <laughs> yep. Uh, Shadow Lords. Let's see, Knife Skulkers love to make contracts with these folks. But they also check over the details repeatedly. Seems like they got a habit of going back on their word or trying to Clint, uh, Bill Clinton their way out of trouble. You'd probably add Hillary to that list. I've seen some point. rat packs dedicate themselves to Grandfather Thunder to fulfill these packs, but I've, I I never made a deal myself. Carrying out the dirty deeds for some werewolf cult doesn't seem like a good way to survive, dude. Yep. Uh, shacking up with the Shadow Lords, that is not survival, that is servitude, we all know that. Uh, and the Shadow Lords, of course, being the Shadow Lords, going back on their word like the traitorous lying bastards they are. You will eventually get screwed out of the deal if you're beneath the Shadow Lords, and if you're above them like the Camarilla, they'll kiss up to you to no end. I suddenly feel really good about Stern being gone. <laughs> okay, the Silenced Riders. So damn mysterious, even I can figure them out. And I'm a tunnel runner. I've traveled with a few, but only because I had something I wanted to get out of them. But then, the wolf knew it the whole damn time, and was trying to get something out of me too. Then the sun's sealy fairy showed up and everything went to hell. But I never found out what the wolf expected out of me. They're just weird. They're mysterious and they go weird places. So, uh, well, it sounds like you shouldn't have been talking with this guy while he was talking with, I don't know, the unsealy court. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, do it that well. Silver Fangs. Make, make it, uh, uh, just checking in with you. I don't have funny mic going on right now, do I? No, we have no funny mic going on. Okay. Okay, the Silver Fangs. Frankie says, back me up on this, Johnny. I hate these guys. Two words. Sacramotius nobles. The way I hear it, way back in the Imperium, some of the old wolves thought they could command all the changeling breeds. Started telling them that what they should do for Gaia. The Silver Fangs were the worst of them, since they considered themselves the nobility of the Garrow. I heard it was a fang that demanded that the girl should get killed off. Uh, that was also a long true. time ago, Frankie. They, they just, they're just a shadow of what they used to be now. Now they're all dangerously inbred, half insane, and overcome with depression. Of course, it still isn't enough punishment for what they did to our ancestors. If you mess with the Silver Fang, especially when they're cubs, half the Garu tribes will get pissed off at you like you wouldn't believe. The other half will be secretly grateful. Yeah, teach a little bastard a lesson. I didn't care. <laughs> you little shit kid. <laughs> yep. Sorry I drop shotted your trash fucking child. <laughs> little sh- the Stargazers. Mystic, Far Eastern, Kung Fu fighting, Enigma addicted freaks. I can never tell if one of them's gonna kick my ass or challenge me to a game I go. Too damn smart for their own good. Last I met one, I challenged him to a Zen poetry contest. First, he tried to impress me with some haiku about cherry blossoms. Then I read half a limerick, hit him on the nose with a stick, and ran away. Seems like a good time. Uh, you, you haven't seen um, any of them around here, have you? I love that fucking story so much. <laughs> like this stargazer, all mystic and shit, sitting there reading this haiku that he spent like the past 50 years writing. Some fucking cartoon character walks up with a stick. Says half a joke and hits him in the face and runs away. That's funny. Yeah, it's like as the shit. tall and jury, like like his like head shapes around to where he get hits by the bat. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, the Uktena. They breed with the indigenous tribes around the world, from what I hear. And it doesn't sound too bad at first, especially if they want to preserve the way humans were thousands of years ago. Unfortunately, this also means that they learn all the dark occult secrets civilizations tried to gloss over. And they practice freaky rituals they don't dare reveal to the other Garrow. They're so freaky that they like they get all the cool shit from everybody else that they'd rather forget. 
and then use we that. We found him reading the Necronomicon and tried to summon an elder god. Uh, Tarik Matu, whatever the fuck it is, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I said the words, not every single syllable, but yeah, I said them. Yeah, I forgot I to. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I love Army I... of Darkness. Now for everybody's favorite. The Wendigo, Johnny. Native American werewolves. Keep a bad medicine. About half a century or two ago, they lost their lands to the Europeans, and they've been raging on about it ever since, which is all everybody ever talks about with the Wendigo. Because their book didn't get released in 2001. I fucking hate this description. The changing breeds lost their whole damn plant to the Garu, and they hand it over to the humans and are killing us, so it's your own damn fault this happened. Basically, yes. And then the, <laughs> then the lost ones, starting with the Bunyip. Uh, Johnny, it's you again. Uh, there were these Australian werewolves, and they got into a disagreement about something, and it was about something like the Black Sparrows lied, and, um, and then they vanished into the dream time, or got killed, or sold in the Bermuda Triangle. Uh, how, how'd I go, Frankie? I don't know. Don't look at me. Not like we're really ever going to meet one. Keep it rolling. All right, uh, Croton. So anyways, a long time ago, I was watching a TV show called In Search Of, uh, you know, with, with the with the Spock. And they had <laughs> the story on about this place called the Roanoke, where there was a bunch of settlers, pilgrims. And then one day, they all mysteriously disappeared. And the only clue was one scr word scratched to the tree, uh, Croton. See, I think a werewolf carved it there, because a member of the tribe died to... Uh, protect the pilgrims from the, the worm or uh, uh is, is that, that's johnny, weird, right johnny no no yeah. more crack for you okay the uh, croatin no. all sacrifice themselves while fighting the worm garo get off on that because they think dying valiantly fighting evil is supposed to be glorious or something i guess if they all died like that i want to mind much uh, i would like to, i would like to point out your bullshit here because you have an entire warrior cast that does that yeah and <laughs> At least we do it for fun. The fucking bullshitter. <laughs> <laughs> the White Howlers. Yeah, this crazy old uh, engine moon mouse was telling me about the Howlers. Uh, see, all the people of Scotland are White Howler kinfolk. And then the White Howlers died off. But I hear that once in a while, one of them gets reborn into the world. So it, And they're like, we're forming the tribe. No, you idiot. That's it. You're not doing this anymore. Listen to me. They're dead. They're all dead. They're never coming back. Some of the Kim folks started out as Scottish, but that was a long time ago. The vast majority of people in Scotland ain't got nothing to do with any of this, okay? The White Hallers all got corrupted by the worm. The tribal totem got flushed down at John, and the few who survived became the Black Spirals. Oh, uh, the Black Spirals. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, they're all corrupted by the worm. Uh, Frankie thinks this, uh, we should be killing them off, uh, scoring some around for doing it. I think they, uh, kill off werewolves, and that means we should just leave them alone. Uh, Johnny, what yes. happens when a rat gets infested with the worm? Or a whole damn colony? You'll get a whole bunch of rabbit rat things, and the black spirals will eat the rest of us alive. There's a reason we get praised for killing the worm, because once it's through with the humans and the werewolves, it's coming after us. And now All right. for the miscellaneous. Let's wrap this up. Yeah, yeah, you've heard of the We Are Not Alone spiel. You're dying to hear about the other freaks, like the so-called masters of the city, huh? That's right. Vampires. These guys are no friends of ours. For one, they're all about the perpetuation of the lie. They hate chaos and things they can't control, so they hate rebels like us. For two, they hate the thought of apocalypse. To them, a war without humans is a war without food. So we got nothing in common. You see one of those butt ugly fellas in the sewers, and he gives you his Come hither, my little friend speech. You turn around, get the hell out of there, get some brothers and sisters together, kick his ass. That, that actually is a good like like pause point because yeah, the Nosferatu, you can expect the rat kin to run to them a whole bunch. Oh yeah. You remember the Nosferatu like to use animalism on rats and have the rats be the little spies. Well, yeah, because there's fucking billions of them. Yeah, so the the very smart thing to do as a rat kin is to pretend you're animalized, only to jump up and grab that Nosferatu by the throat and kill them. Yeah, that sounds right. Pull out uh, the gat and, and let the 40 bang. Now, ironically, there's another weakness they have, but I'm going to get into that after the segment's done. 
Uh, and yeah, they they turn into one of them too. Uh, of course, it only seems to work on the unluckiest bastards, those who have offended Mama Rat. It, it's bad. Uh, don't know how most of the vampires keep themselves preserved, but it don't work on a blood sucking rat. They rot like it was an ordinary corpse. They much just fall over and quit moving. <clears throat> well, that's what left of them all since uh, um, hope what's left of them isn't conscious um, when there's nothing but bones left. Skeleton rat. A skeleton rat. Wizards. Uh, get, call the Cappadocians. Yes. <laughs> a rat skeleton smoking a cigar would actually kind of go hard. There we go. It'd be creepy. <laughs> That'd be cool, dude. Look, it, 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 uh, we've already established this from Warhammer. A skeleton smoking a cigar will always go hard. Uh, Ryan, post pictures of true. skeletons with gun in their hands while we're doing this next bit. Yeah. <laughs> Skeletons with gun in their hands? Yeah, with a gun in their hand. The gangsta Popeye memes. <laughs> Jelly boys. Tell me, uh, I, the whiz. Hey, did you know there are some honest uh, Merlins out there? They don't have any pointy hats and long beards. Well, 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 I get really powerful ones, do, But they are doing this shtick even as we speak. Um, problem is that nobody really cares about magic anymore, so they're pretty sensitive and sulky. I mean, nothing worse than a sulky guy who throws out lightning bolts. Yeah, Merlin, whatever. Oh, and there's fairies, too. They're as big as anybody and don't have pretty little wings. Hey, I told you I seen one, right? His name sounded like... <laughs> his name sounded kind of like a sneeze. And he was black, too. I don't think any of those Nazis who airbrushed unicorns on notebooks and all that crap I ever thought it, what a fairy could have been black, heaven forbid. Uh, black heaven for... I th is that supposed to be for Bend or F O R F for Fend? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Could have been Black Heaven for Fend. What the fuck? <laughs> Just goes to show. Uh, behold, as it turns out, the people that made Lord of the Rings Rings of Power were right. <laughs> <laughs> for crying out loud, Frankie! Don't call them fairies. Call them changelings, because it seems to go better. Um. Kind of like a, kind of like a baby stealing kind of word, but if if they like it, um, then hey. Oh, what does that leave us with? Uh, ghosts, yeah. And there's a good reason not to revisit the scene of your crime. It's ghosts, kid. They tend to hang around in places that they died, and they could make your life real unpleasant. So if you're gonna start nuking buildings left and right, don't go back to the site, because the haints will get you. All right, that's enough for one day, kid. You really want to learn about this stuff, you go out and meet these guys yourself. Now beat it. Johnny, what did the Rat, what did the rat King say? So now I got to get him out. Johnny did what the Rat King said, so now I got to get him out of here. Hey, Johnny, you beat the rat. Now let's get out of yeah. here before that skulker kicks your ass again. There there we go. We got skulls. Oh, holy fucking shit. Thank you for posting MFKZ in the chat. I don't know who that is. Uh, uh, the, 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 is... Skull, the, skull, the skull with the, fire, with the flame head, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, no yeah. problem. I never uh, watched Mufuckers. No, uh, that'll be such a great movie to do for a movie night. I, I isn't Mufuckers basically just like stick figure boondocks? Uh, well, like it started off as like an independent comic, and then, um, I think it's still being made. Actually, I thought I remember it on Netflix, but I never like actually watched it. Yeah, I just I just like love little animated movies like this. Um, uh, you notice that they don't talk about hunters. I guess, do the hunters even care about them? I don't think the hunters know. With... No. <laughs> no. I mean, uh, on top of that, the imbued. Uh, we've got more important things to worry about the imbued to do than just rats. I mean, the vampires first and foremost, and then demons after that, and then the forces of the worm. And the occasional werewolf and wizard when it pops up. But the rats, not really. Yeah. And lastly, the demons. Um, a demon would just absolutely wreck the ratkin. Yeah, no question, no kidding. And okay. speaking of, the ratkin have a pretty damn big weakness. You want to know it? What is that? Vulnerability to insanity. That does not as, surprise me. As in presence, no, dominate, and dementation. What? Those gifts have um. If a rat king tries to resist those, they have 
um, plus two difficulty adds to the rolls trying to resist that. At the wild mind? Yeah, thanks to that, which makes them very susceptible to mind-controlling powers. Oh. It said pretty rough. So, keep in mind, with our live play, we're about to have a bunch of ratkin fight a Malkavian elder. Oh. Huh. That's going to go very well. Given that demontation can affect multiple people. Oh no, the rat can are fucked. Yeah. Oh yeah, they are. But hey, this you makes want... taking back that cairn easier. Yeah, it's, we just gotta hope that Heaven's Divide does most of the heavy lifting for us. Oh look, you tore up half the problem for us. Now we can just, you know, go ahead, cut her head off. Easy as pie. And there's a massive section in this book, like majority of this is dedicated to mechanics about building your ratkin character where it's essentially the same rules as the werewolves, you just change a few words around. Um, pretty much, there are no social builds with Ratkin. You are making a warrior first and foremost. You are here to kill. You're not here to make friends. Yes, we said and in the beginning, we, the Ratkin were put on this earth to kill. Which reflects in our gifts, which we will now talk about with Ryan. Yes. Gift tab. Gifts. Where did my tab go? Right there. So, you... I was going to go through and do every single gift, but like but you said, no, there isn't enough time. So I chose eight of the ones that I thought were cool as fuck. All right, let's do it. You, you do the description. I'll do the system. All right. So we're going to start off with our common rat kin gifts. The one I chose was shadow throw. While vocally expressing their anger, the Ratkin can form a shadowy field of power around a dagger or other sharp object balanced for throwing. Knives, skulkers, knife skulkers, for instance, may choose to call out a victim's crime, murderer, while forming his instrument of revenge. When the Ratkin hurls his dagger at a foe, the blade is propelled by the darkness around it and strikes with a supernatural force. This gift is taught by a night spirit, which usually demands a tale of unpunished criminals' dark secrets. See. Now, the Ratkin spent a rage point and targets a single victim within line of sight. The player rolls Perception and Athletics, difficulty 6, um, with the usual firearms modifier. Uh, the blade strikes with more force than a rarer rat can muster, inflicting strength plus three aggravated damage. If the blade is already magical, it only inflicts plus, plus two. Now, you remember when we were playing Las Vegas by Night, that yeah. rat can encounter we had, every rat can had this. Yeah, every yeah. rat can almost wrecked our shit. Yeah, you, you got your ass beat, and then Vigo and Ragnar had to come to the rescue. And thank God they did. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think. That day I was rolling like shit. Yeah, like Sylvester could have handled it by himself, but if it wasn't for the rolls. <laughs> yeah. It's all about the rolls. The strongest caitiff to ever live. And God bless uh, him. I love that man. Uh, he's gonna become the new blood god. <laughs> uh, you know what? I'll watch right. that shit. The the next one I chose was from Twitcher. It is a rank five and it's called all hell this is pretty fun by summoning a swarm of widling spirits and rat spirits you can invoke sheer pandemonium they'll crawl the walls manipulate mundane objects randomly and cause sheer chaos any non ratkin in the room is hit with delirium spend one gnosis everyone present in the scene rolls willpower difficulty eight Anyone who fails to roll gets hit with delirium, just as if they were human. Humans Vampires, are Vampires, all... mages, changelings, they don't give a fuck. And of course, usual humans automatically fail. And, um, you move the step up the delirium chart, so it, like, how much memory hole you have. Um, we left that out for 3.5, but in old editions it had it, had this. You want to breach the veil? Choose rank five all hell. Yeah, go, go ahead. It will cause everybody to lose their damn mind. I mean, at least they right. can't, you know, tell about it later because they can't snitch. True. Snitches uh, get delirium. Is <laughs> from engineer. It is a rank three. I thought it was pretty cool. It's called summon electricity. 
uh, far more effective than a general right of binding. This gift summons an electricity element and binds it to an, electri an electrical device for a short period of time. Even broken devices will be able to operate with a little judis uh, judicious jury rigging. The system. Roll Gnosis versus the difficulty of the local gauntlet. You must be near a source of electricity, which isn't hard in a city. With four successes, you summon the spirit. Bonding it to a battery or electrical device requires a Gnosis roll against the spirit's Gnosis. That's typically around six or seven. If you succeed, it is bound and will continue to supply power within one week per success. Five successes binds it for a year. After that, the spirit warranty expires. Free power, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, the <laughs> next one is a rank five from the same... Um, uh, same aspect. What is it? Aspect. There we go. Yeah. It's called a uh, death ray. No. Oh. You can discharge <laughs> energy through your fingertips. Granted, you'll need to hook yourself up to a car battery or a wall outlet for a few hours each day. But if you ever had a Garou try choking you to death, you know it's worth it. Uh, that's right. kind of it's like an episode, it's like cranked. That's great. <laughs> you must spend at least an hour meditating while attached to the supply of electricity. Spend one gnosis and roll intelligence plus enigmas difficulty six. For each success, you gain a temporary dot in a new trait called electricity. If you spend another point of gnosis, you can charge up this trait even further, maxing out at ten. For the day, your body will have a constant static electric charge until you discharge. To attack with the death ray, you roll with your electric electricity pool dice. Attacking will uh, with a touch is difficulty six. At range of up to fifty feet, it's difficulty eight. If you hit, you inflict one level of health uh, in aggravated damage per success. You roll the damage to soak this is difficulty eight. The electricity trait goes down one each time you use the death ray. Optionally, you can burn off points of electricity instead to um, use them um, for other gifts like Gift of the Battery and some electricity. Yeah. I thought that was pretty fucking cool. It's like that uh, scene cool. from Avengers <laughs> when Thor shocks Iron Man with lightning and he just like gets power at 400% it shoots it right back at him. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, um, like when you're playing Pokemon and you hit Raichu with a lightning bolt. Yep. Power at 400%. Yep. <laughs> All right. And the next one is from Shadow Seer. It's a rank two, and it's called Summon Anglin. Usually, when the shape changer needs to replenish their gnosis, they summon an Anglin and stalk it. In urban uh, areas, this hunt takes on a few unique twists. A shadow seer with this gift knows it, uh, knows them intimately. The angling is always disguised as something mundane. Only other me uh, only the members of the Rat Pack can recognize that it is a spirit. Humans react to this in unpredictable ways, watching mad street people pursue a fleeing ice cream truck. A bow with a balloon, or a cloud of butterflies. Each has different results. Spend one Gnosis and roll permanent Gnosis against the difficulty of the local gauntlet. With three successes, an inkling appears, but in a disguise that only a Shadow Seer can see through. Uh, the Ratkin must chase down and kill it. If they do, they gain ten Gnosis to divide equally between members of the Rat Pack. You want to participate in killing something? Guess what? <laughs> yep. Have fun. Watch us murder this balloon. Let's just stab this ice cream truck to death. Right. Just like a thousand rats, just like tiny little Swiss Army <laughs> knives stabbing the tires of a truck. <laughs> I thought that was pretty neat. That is funny. Silly. <laughs> the next one is from a tunnel runner. Let's see if I can find it again, because I accidentally un... Oh, no, it's right there. It's called Cheese It! <laughs> With this gift, the tunnel runner can help his entire pack bolt from danger. 
Although, using it tends to be risky. First, the tunnel runner calls out a brief phrase to signify the use of the skiff, like everyone out. Though every ratkin who wants to take advantage of this opportunity spends one point of rage, the tunnel runner spends three. All the players uh, representing the fleeing rats then play a quick hand of rock, paper, scissors. Uh, on the count of three, everyone throws down a hand for rock, paper, scissors. Sto uh, the storyteller plays two. Everyone who made the same choice as the storyteller is lucky. The ratkin bolts to a place of hiding within line of sight, even nearby rooftops. Any ratkin who chose the most popular choice can bolt to the nearest hiding place, even if they didn't make the same choice as the storyteller. Ever the rat stays right where they are. The gift does not work for them. If the tunnel runner does, doesn't make the same choice as the storyteller, he can try to skiff again next round. So you can basically just, like, scatter everybody if shit gets too hairy, and then you just yeah, the slide, off. Yeah, the slide whistle goes off and a cloud of dust appears. Yeah. I I have an idea to play a Ratkin with this ability. <laughs> now that's a rank 5 Ratkin gift. That's going to take a yeah. long time for him to get that. I can fucking bolt! He's like, <laughs> okay, we, I think we did our job. Let's go home. Uh, <laughs> the next one is from Rodents. It is a rank 4, and it's called Mind of the Swarm. Once a swarm of rats has been summoned, or if you encounter them in the wild, you can control uh, control them through sheer force of will. You cannot motivate them to assault anything in their path. That requires a right of the swarm, uh, but you can direct their movements. This gift can also be used to summon up a few extra rats or rat spirits for the duration of one scene. Oddly enough, it's taught by a rat spirit. You don't say. Uh, the size of swarm is dependent on a manipulation plus animal kin roll. Spend a point of gnosis and then uh, a point of willpower. Uh, one success, 13 rats. Two, 20 rats. Three, 30 rats. Four, 40 rats. And five, 50 rats. The rats kind of growing in size as you get yeah. more difficulty. Um, successes. If the rodents can gather all these rats into one place before the right of the swarm is invoked, Difficulty for that right is redu reduced by two. Uh, you can't summon allies in addition to those summoned by the Rat of the Swarm, but if you like, you can attract two extra rats for each success on your initial roll. Uh, take two guesses to write up what Rat of the Swarm does. Swarms? Uh, it allows the group of rats to swarm. Yeah, it's, it, it's in the name. Yeah, just make a whole bunch of them do the same thing. I chose this one because it's not often you get to see Animal Ken as a, one of the roles. Yeah, for, for for Defenders of Nature, that's a, typically an overlooked stat. Yeah. So I, I, that's why I chose that one. And, and, and you need to have Animal Ken if you don't want animals to freak out around you uh, as a Garu. Yeah. And the last one is a Hamid rank, and it is called... Uh, it's a rank one. It's called Udurat. Udurat? The intoxicating Udurat. Or Ooh. Udurat. Ooh. Oh, weird. This one. Kapow. My friend hit enter. It, it, it is the French. Uh, the intoxicating <laughs> scent of rat is not fully appreciated by all mammals. In fact, most humans found it dying right foul as do the jagglings of the jaffings of the weaver. Uh, spend one point of rage and roll charisma and primal urge difficulty 7 if the target's downrend, difficulty 8 when anywhere else. Humans and weaver spirits who lose uh, one dice to a dice pool, this sense is kind of fucked up, humans and weaver spirits will lose one dice from a dice pool within 20 feet. We have a Gafflings who can't make a successful willpower roll to 49 will flee. So behold, if you want to de-weaver an area, this is how you do it. Whatever works. This works on the net spider, by the way. Oh, that's fucking fantastic. What rank is this gift? You know, the, the giant a robo... Yeah, the giant robo spider that guns everything down. That's rank fucking spectacular. Yep. Uh, and 
Now, here's the thing for a little li uh, the live play that we do. Um, our character that uh, posted his portrait in history pages, Burst Bruiser. Um, I already told you what breed he is, Rodens. Would you like to guess what aspect I made him? Um, hmm. I don't think he, he's. I figured it was just a warrior, but no, he's a bit too powerful for that. Hmm. Got to think about this one. Ryan, you got an idea? As for an aspect? Hmm. Yes. Which one was it? Let's see. Let's go. I like. Yeah, yeah burst, burst bruiser, like our our ratkin antagonist in our New York game. Oh, uh... let me take a look at the options again. You oh, got a choice of eight. You got a one in eight chance of getting this right. Let's see, yeah, ratkin. Uh, Kyle, I'm also tipping your hand to get your right notes ready. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh. I I couldn't tell you. I want to say either a rodent or a tunnel runner. See, well, he is a rodent already. Um, that that being his auspice, much mousin is why I end up making him. Oh, okay. Oh, because after all, you haven't seen him use the level five gift that the much mousin have. I don't know if I want to at this rate. He's yeah. already kind of <laughs> fucking scary. He's already super powerful, and he's got. Like a giant worm spirit inside his belly, so... <laughs> I thought that was a wild spirit. Not, not wild spirit, sorry. Yeah, I was confused there for a second. He's, if it was a worm spirit, we would all have to worm. kill him. Yeah. So, uh, I, I'm getting like very excited to play this guy again in our life play. <laughs> yeah. Imagine next time we see him, we're going to have to kill him. Let's see. Uh, next up, the rights. Yes, right time. Okay. So, Ratkin writes, there's a fucking lot of them. So, I picked a couple of them that, that, uh, that seem the most not interesting. A single one is level 5. No, they do not have level 5 rights. Uh, they do have a varied level right, but we'll get to that later. Um, <clears throat> so, starting off at right 1, of course, we have Right of the Birthing Plague. It's a mystic right. <laughs> Once a rat pack has learned to properly serve one of the three major incarna, they are ready to help bring more lost children into the fold. After the fulfillment of a rat pack's first contract, a rat gaffling will seek out the pack and teach them the rite of the birthing plague. He may also immediately tell them where a prospective rat, where rat might be found. Rescuing lost kinfolk brings great renown, and the rat pack will no doubt immediately school them on what they've learned so far. Plague lords typically learn this rite as their first rite. Performing the ritual summons a uh, rat gaffling to be a, to bite a prospective ratkin and determine whether a new were rat can be creative. The victim is usually either rat kinfolk or human kinfolk, or a newly separate or a newly spawned metis were rat. If it is performed on a human, the results are deadly. Once bitten, the subject is ravaged by disease, which consumes mind, body, and spirit alike. The victim dies. There's one less human or weakling rat in the world. If the victim survives, he slowly transforms into a full-blood ratkin. Hallucinations from the plague offer revelations of the new were-rat's life. Garrow, other shape-changers, and their kinfolk are not affected by this rite. They've already found their calling. Humans can be wounded by this rite, but they won't become ratkin unless they are ratkin kinfolk. Ratkin infected a second time with this rite are unaffected by it. They have already pledged to serve their aspects for the rest of their days. System. First, a ratkin must successfully bite or claw a chosen victim. If the attack does any damage, the right master then rolls wits and rituals at difficulty 7 to spread the infection. The virulence of the disease depends on the number of successes. Success 1 inflicts the victim with one aggravated health level of damage. Three successes inflicts enough aggravated damage to take her down to the wounded health level, bestowing a fever dream of terrible visions and a full day of unconsciousness. Five successes inflicts enough aggravated damage to take the victim down to the incapacitated health level. The dreams continue until the victim is resuscitated. If the victim is a rat, is rat king kinfolk, she then has a 1 in 10 chance of becoming infected. One roll, roll one die against a difficulty of 10. If the roll fails, the kinfolk may survive. Roll stamina, difficulty 6. 
Three successes means the victim survives, but only after protracted illness. If the roll scores fewer successes, the victim takes one additional level of aggravated damage each day until cured or killed. Those who aren't actually kin have a much rougher time surviving. Normal mortals wounded by this right make the stamina roll to survive at difficulty 8. Any infected kinfolk is continually on the verge of losing control. Kinfolk characters caught in the throes of the birthing plague have an effective Rage 4 Gnosis 4 until they undergo the first change. They can't spend these points, but they can make frenzy rolls and rapture rolls based on these two traits. So basically, this is how you determine on whether or not somebody will or will not serve the were rats, and also if they can survive a fucking disease. They also call their first change the birthing plague, as in, it is this massive rash that takes over your body that slowly begins to mutate you into a ratkin. Sometimes it is horribly painful, and other times it is marvelous. It yeah. depends on rat to rat. It does. But at the at the end of the day, it's, you know, basically the wild being the wild. Uh, as it turns out, diseases aren't the only thing uh, that the, the worm has. In fact, in fact, I think even the weaver dips into us, too. A little bit, because, yeah. Because, you know, like, sickness isn't ex exclusively a worm thing, because you've got, like, say, with Malkaf having, like, the wild mind and... You can have like stuff like schizophrenia with the wild. They also have stuff like OCD with the weaver. Yeah, it's very true. Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, moving uh, on. See, so yeah, I get the plague. Yes. Uh, moving on from that, uh, I noticed that this was a little bit important when I was talk when I was reading the relationships. Uh, the contract right. This one's a little bit long, so you have to give me a mulligan. Right. This is the first right of a knife of a knife skulker learns. Although no lone wanderer would take the road without it. The contract right is a method by which a rat king can sell his skills to another group of supernatural creatures. A particularly skeptical were rat may even take out a contract with his own rat pack before he joins. Before working with any group any other group of individuals, a rat can always has the right to ask, What's in it for me? The most common types of compensation include safe passage through the domain, access to a sacred site, supplies, talons, and an exchange of favors. When an area is overrun with ratkin, swarms of rare rats hide themselves out and hire themselves out to anyone who can meet their demands. Ret uh, retinues of court of courtier is it courtiers or courtiers? I don't know. Courtier, it's it is the French. Uh, retinue of courtier and other traditional rat packs insist that their tunnel runners should approach a group initially, but their knife skulker should negotiate the final contract right. Anarchist rat packs allow were-rats of any aspect to perform this rite. There is only one overriding provisio. A rat cannot betray other ratkin as part of a contract. The litany of survival states that the were-rat should, uh, should betray others before betraying his own kind. Knife skulkers enforce this dictum with brutal efficiency. The rite serves as a declaration, with the spirits as witness of what each party in the contract intends to get out of the alliance. With rat packs, this is largely a formality. A were rat who breaks a contract right loses cunning renown and damages his reputation, but is still free to make other contracts. A rat can dealing with other supernatural creatures, however, takes a big risk when performing this right. Breaking a contract will result in the were rat being hounded by rat spirits until the terms are fulfilled. Were rats may dismiss such obligations as trivial, but other supernatural creatures often seek revenge for betrayal. When other supernatural creatures enter into a contract right with a ratkin, the most common goal involves gathering information, stealing valuables, or assassination. Uh, as an example, if you steal that fetish from the sept leader, I'll burn down the insane asylum and kill the vampire inside of it. Deal. Ratkin can always sweeten any deal with a few carefully disclosed facts, giving their race a reputation, as one would expect for ratling on supernatural out for ratting on, super on former supernatural allies. This is considered sleazy by anyone other than Ratkin, who fully expects such behavior. Two guide <laughs> <laughs> yes, good old Ratkin. Two guidelines are essential for any outside species who want to make contracts with were rats. Never turn your back on Ratkin and never betray a contract. Other supernatural creatures who try to cheat were rats succumb to a very important clause: the right of a knife skulker to seek redress. To seek redress. 
any good contract includes a punishment clause, and skulkers love to enforce them. System. At the end of negotiations, the right master spends one gnosis and rolls manipulation and rituals. The, spirit wit the spirits witness this transaction. Your totem will acknowledge your pact by giving a member of your deceit a brief vision. Some bastards like to leave a few loopholes in an agreement. The totem's vision often relates to at least one of the flaws in the contract. As the storyteller describes a scene that, so that shows a situation where the contract could break down. The amount of detail and length of this vision depend on the number of successes on the final roll. If either party re uh, reneges on the contract, the totem will bless the right master with a vision of the transgression. If the contract is broken, the method for enforcing the punishment clause is left entirely to the knife skulker. Some prefer to harry and harass those who refuse to hold up their end of the contract. A few, ritual a few favor ritual crippling, that is, getting a victim alone and taking him down to crippled with aggravated damage. The most effective method is a simple assassination. Any of these tactics spreads the message that no one double deals the rats. For storytellers who are using renown rules, fulfilling a punishment clause is a good way to gain infamy, but only if your totem acknowledges its approval of your act with a vision. Where rats trade favors with other supernatural creatures like pack rats trade shiny things, but any staunch rat can role player is advised to write down every pact he's made. No doubt the storyteller will remember every deal that you've made in just as much detail, if not more. That's a long one, but that is very, very essential to Ratkin society. Ratkin mm -hmm. live and die off of contracts. If you cannot find a way to, to gain infamy, to get what you want when you want it with the skills that you have, then you're as good as dead. You don't work, you don't eat. Basically. Honestly, kind of based on the Ratkin. You see why they're kind of okay with working with the Shadow Lords and they're not in any rush to get out of the contract with them? After, you know, Grandfather Thunder orchestrated the kidnapping of a lot of them. It's because the Shell Lords are feeding them. Yes. That's why. Don't bite the hand that feeds. Even the rat can know that. Even though, even if the hand kidnaps you and holds you against your will. I think that's called Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> True. Okay. Uh, moving on to level two. This one I just thought was really funny. Uh, right of Crash Space. This is a mystic rite. While werewolves build elaborate cairns to support entire septs of Garo, were-rats can't afford such ostentatious surroundings. If the right of the cardboard palace isn't enough for you, a ritualist can transform any hidden home where rats can nest, recover, and meditate. These hidey holes are often used by rats who are about to give birth, establishing a peaceful site for raising dozens of pups. While Garo can meditate just about anywhere, were-rats have to remain someplace relatively safe while meditating to regain gnosis. The shrine at a rat can colony or crash space uh, blessed with this ritual are the two most common choices. System. Creating crash space requires a point of gnosis and an intelligence plus survival roll at difficulty 7. The home is safe for one week for each success. After 10 minutes of scurrying about and gnawing at the appropriate corners, the shelter is cozy enough to serve as a place of meditation. The were rat must also erect a shrine out of nifty stuff from around the neighborhood. Once this is done... Any rat can in call meditation at this site can, re can regain gnosis. Any were rat can attempt this by rolling intelligence and enigmas. For each success obtained, the rat king gains a point of gnosis after an hour of contemplation and quiet time. Under the optional rat can psychology rules, a reflective and calm were rat will then appear saner and more stabler to those who encounter them. So basically, you just build yourself a nice little place to chill out for a little bit. Crack open a miller and get some gnosis back. Yeah, speaking of the Carver Palace, and you notice that the Carver Palace and the shopping cart are both rights that the rat can have. Yes, the Bonars yeah. had taught them that. Now, the question is, who taught who? It, did the Bonars teach them that, or was it the rats who taught the Bonars that? From what I was looking at, it seemed like the Garrow taught them. See, because, that's what see. they want you to think, of course. Right at the shopping cart, just as common among Bonars as it is among rat. Okay, so it doesn't say. I thought it did. Yeah. You gotta find out who's the bullshitter here. Basically. Uh, and then, <laughs> this is a short one. I'm just going to do Rite of the Purified Body as an accord rite. All right. This rite cleanses another bo another's body of all poisons, whether magical or natural. It can counter the rite of the birthing plague for those who haven't become ratkin after the final stamina roll or the effects of a plague lord epidemic. This, isn't, this is a rite of accord performed by a healthy ratkin who spends one point in gnosis. The roll is charisma and rituals difficulty seven. 
I thought this one was interesting, however short, because it's neat to think that in order to know how to, um, it, it's like starting a fire. Before you know how to put out a fire, you need to know how to start a fire. If you know how to start a plague, you need to know how to stop a plague. Because, you know, even the rats need ratkin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Y'all learn how to clamp your own mess, right? Exactly. Good on the ratkin for that. Uh, moving on to rank three. I thought this one was funny as well. Right of the shiny thing. Rat packs disagree all the time. Through, com through confrontation, the members of a pack drive up their rage, turning anxiety into raw energy. When an issue when an issue desperately needs to get resolved, a rat can with this right may invoke it to settle an issue once and for all. This the mystic may use the right the ritual of the shiny thing to resolve any dispute between were rats and her local nest, or find a temporary leader of a pack if necessary. Performing the right relieves angst and prevents pack members from turning on each other. Like well, you know, the invocation is very informal, something along the lines of "I demand the shiny thing." At that moment, all the pack members bolt, looking for the shiniest, most impressive object they can find. The master of this rite waits behind, watching for the first three ratkin who return from their quest. Only the first three rats who return have a chance of, quote, resolving the rite. Once the rest of the pack returns, they then vote on which item is the most impressive. That item becomes the shiny thing, a relic which must be carried or displayed by the new temporary pack leader. The keeper of the shiny may be then pass judgment on how to resolve the most immediate problem. A pack may add additional restrictions on this rite when it's performed. In most packs, the shiny thing must not be given freely or stolen. It must be found. The item must be discovered after the rite is declared. No fair hoarding every shiny thing you can find for the next observance. Rat spirits will watch over the rat can involve to make sure the proper rules are obeyed. As a side note, where rats may not use the scrounge gift to fulfill this ritual. On rare occasions, the right master may, de may demand a specific object. For instance, some uh, munch, uh, Munchmousen claim one of the most famous invocations of this right occurred during a winter long ago, when a tyrannical rat king wanted to find an heir to replace him. He promised the th his throne to the thirst rat king warrior who could bring him a shiny new nutcracker. The rest of the story has been told as a Christmas legend ever since, though with a decidedly different ending. System. The right master asks the spirits to watch over the poor fools who go dashing off in this mystical scavenger hunt. Each player announces where his character is searching, what he is looking for, and what dice pool he thinks he can use to find an item. Otherwise, Frankie is going to use perception plus medicine to find surgical tools in the doctor's office, or Johnny's using manipulation and subterfuge to seduce the clerk at the jewelry store. The storyteller may, of course, suggest an alternative dice pool. The rat can, with the most successes on this roll, are considered, quote, the first ones back. The rest of the characters then vote on the most impressive shiny thing. Afterwards, whenever there is any doubt about who's leading the pack, the victor of this right may gleefully hold the shiny thing aloft to proclaim his leadership. Not only is this who's funny, the boss? not only is who's this funny, boss? this actually works. Like, it, it, it's, it sounds dumb, but within the, within the idea of the rat can... That worked perfectly for them. It's like, I have the biggest shiny, so I get to be the leader. See, I can also I, work with ravens. I've got the gun with the silver plates on it, therefore I get to be the leader. Basically, whoever got the chrome gat. <laughs> um, shall I go over the right of the swarm? Because I want to do this one. If If you would like to, then yes. The right to the swarm, level four. This maddening call may only be invoked by a ratkin of the warrior aspect. Breeding armies of rats is a sacred duty. Every every ratkin, uh, kinfolk in a colony dreams of spawning more soldiers for the army of the apocalypse. The right of the swarm must be justified before the spirits will allow it. The warrior must give a brief tirade about the victim who will be overwhelmed by the swarm. This may call, include a call for justice, a sta statement of crimes, or simply a series of insults about his crimes um, and of his race and existence. Uh, so yeah, if you want to, uh, if you want to form a hate mob, <laughs> this is the yes, this is what you do. <laughs> the rat can first spin a point of gnosis and roll manipulation and animal kin. The first uh, creatures to be called up by the swarm are the normal rats of the area. 
if the cause is just, rat spirits will materialize in the host of rodents to direct them towards the appropriate victim. Roll charisma plus rituals. The size of the rats depend on the number of successes. The storyteller consults the section um, on swarms, where we don't need to worry about that too much, but one or two successes, average rats. Three or four, a New York rat. Uh, five, uh, the sewers of New York rat. Burst bruiser comes out at five successes. There we go. Uh, see, Kyle, you don't play Battletoads, do you? <clears throat> Battle what? Battle, Battle Toads. I have not, no. Let's see, because um, I end up like getting the idea for Burst Bruiser from like one of the characters in that game. Did you actually? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, um, there's there's a rat in the game who's like drawn like all like the grossest of like the early, the early nineties. Nice. Um, see, let me pull up a picture of him. That's not fucking shit, Res. Let's I don't see. know if you're gonna have that or not. And we can't use anything for Furrow Fanti either. Absolutely not. It's because he's like he's got like a big man body, so he's like seen as like a cum icon by a few people. Go on, Johnny. <laughs> you try, you try, you're accusing me of something here, boy? Uh, you did make Wrath of the Storm. And the Zobi here, we go, <laughs> here we go, I found something. You're, you're probably going to have to zoom in on this. Okay. No um, yeah, uh, history pages, here you go. There we go. Yeah, it makes sense. I don't know, I feel like Burst Bruiser is like, you know, a lot bigger and scarier looking than him. Yeah. This dude just looks gross. He looks like yeah. Wario, but a rat. Yeah, he's got like the like the big greasy mo mullet. Yeah, yeah, he looks very nineties. Oh no, that's very and, that's a very large burst bruiser right there. See, and the the fun thing with um all these different swarms, you also have like a few like uncategorized rights too. That the like the very rights where it seems like Brian Campbell and the writing staff threw up their hands and said, "We don't really know where we want to put these, so um, you decide." Yep. So this one here is called the right of warding. It is a nest right. Rat can pride themselves on hiding their nests well. The right of warding makes it difficult for any creature to find where a colony is hidden. This right is performed every time the population of a ratkin nest surges. The strength of a ratkin's sacred site depends on the number of were-rats who live there, focusing chaos on the spiritual center of the nest. Once the local population has grown enough, the local mystic then performs this right in tribute to the rat incarna. The right master must be, a rank, must be of rank equal to the new level of the nest. Rat spirits will then invest the spiritual center of the nest. If the rat spirits don't think that the site is a good one, they may demand that a local rat pack undertake an umbral quest on behalf of the local were rats. Fulfilling this quest may decide the proper name of the nest, the name of a new tribe, or even the title of the next rat king. System. Roll charisma and rituals. The difficulty is equal to 5 plus the size of the local colony. Remember the number of successes. It's the colony's concealment rating. If anyone who is not a ratkin tries to use a skill or supernatural ability to determine the location of the nest, subtract these successes from the roll. The rite must be performed once each month to maintain its effect. Basically, you just have to keep doing this to make sure that your place is well hidden. Makes sense, right? <laughs> yes. Absolutely does. And we only have three totems to talk about. Yes. See, uh, I will give one. I'll give this one to you, Ryan. Ooh, ooh, ooh. See. what is it? What is it? See, now keep in mind these are the rat kin. Who do you think is their totem? Uh, the rat. That's right, mouse. Y yes, that's, that's right. He's absolutely right. Raccoon. Yeah. Uh, read out the stat bonuses that you get from rat. Is it say? That bonuses you get. Uh, where is it? Individual. Individual rat children. Rats children subtract one from the difficulty of bite rolls, and from the difficulty rolls involving stealth, stealth or quiet. As a pack, uh, they can fall on a pool of five willpower points per story. Uh, bone narrows will aid the pack, and even Ratkin will somewhat tolerate, uh, be somewhat tolerant of the pack's existence. Now, now the now the fun thing, 
the ban. Rats, children must not kill vermin of any kind. Yeah, right, actually... so no cockroaches, no dung beetles, no flies, no mosquitoes. Damn. I also would say I really like the first of the uh, trading card pictures for Rat, the one with the blue background. That yeah. looks really <laughs> fucking cool. See, speaking of Rat, by the way, he split himself in two because he realized that his society was going to fall apart without compassion. So he made a nice version of himself, his feminine aspect that he denies, Mama Rat. So Rat God is his male side, Mama Rat is his female side, where it's the the ultimate dad and the ultimate mom is ultimately uh, what those are. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed and... that isn't a totem that I can see on the page here. Oh, by the way, uh, no, that's because of the same person. Ah, I see. And the thing is, for our Halloween special, we had Rat as our totem, making it very easy to land bite attacks. Yeah, bite attacks are already the, the easiest to land. Yeah, so... Call for consistent damage here. That rat is a very good totem from a map perspective. Yeah, especially if you're playing like in a rune campaign. All right now, Kyle, you get to read Grandfather Thunder. Grandfather Thunder. I feel like we've done yeah. this already. I'm getting some odd yeah. deja vu. Well, well, just like a reminder, because it's been a long time since we did the Shadow Lords episode. That's true. Yeah, Grandfather Thunder. Uh, so the background cost for Grandfather Thunder is seven points. So it's very expensive. Traits. Thunder's pack can call upon five extra willpower points per story, and they gain three dice to etiquette. All pack members can also gain two extra intimidation dice whenever they invoke Thunder. Many Shadow Lords see the little difference between respect and fear. Each pack member also gains one point of honor renown. Shadow Lords will follow the pack's activities with keen interest. The ban, however... Grandfather Thunder commands his children to give their peers and their rivals no more respect than they deserve. So they are very much up on very much up on etiquette and being the boss of things. Makes the, sense the, with the Shadow Lords. The the snootiness of the, the Shadow Lords will begin to rub off on the rat kid that they employ. I imagine the other rat kid don't like that very much. <laughs> That's where we get the rat kings from. Yes, indeed. And next up, the City Fathers. So, this is the spirit of a city. Just, like, name a city. It will have a City Father in it. Uh, what these guys do, they're Totems of Wisdom. Background costs six. Uh, if you are a Glassworker, you are banned from having these. Yeah, what they do is that they'll give you the gift of Attunement. A rank four gift right out the gate. Uh, which pretty much allows you to freely commune with all spirits within an area. That's fucking crazy. So that's yeah, kick spirit speech to the curb. You just got this now. Um, along with that, followers of the city father gain an instinctive knowledge of a city. As in, where everything is sold, where civil places are, where, um, where the government buildings are, the jails, the sewer systems, the street system, the bus schedule. You know everything about your city just by taking the one as a totem. And periodically, citizens who love the city will grow zealous and possessed by the spirit of the city father and will rush to your aid in times of need. That's kind of neat, actually. Now the ban. City father periodically asks favor from those who are in packs beneath him. Should they refuse, his patronage will be withdrawn. Occasionally he's going to ask you for a solid and you have to respect the solid. Well, I mean, yes, you do. yeah. Yeah. And lastly, we get to our usual wrap up here, but I want to tell us like a like a weird ratkin story first. Yes. So there was a few lore characters in the back of these books. And there's one in here that feels like this complete shit post that I want to talk about. Tell us the shit post. Let's see. I believe it was who is it, Johnny Y2K? No, not him. Uh, well, well, I can briefly like, mention this guy. He's um, Ratkin Metis, who grew up spying on IBM. And he's this massive computer wizard who tried to make Y2K a thing. That's kind of funny. So, yes, this man did indeed try to launch all the nukes on um, New Year's Eve 1999. And all he did was fuck up a couple of Australian vending machines. <laughs> 
here we go. Danny Diz Walton, who was a Ratkin born in 1910, who said that he was the man who invented Steamboat Willie, Mickey Mouse, that he was the one who invented it, and that through psychic communication, Oob Iwerks and um, Walt Disney stole his idea, and now he demands um, reparations from both of them. But um, that's not going to happen. <laughs> Is I mean, Walt Disney sense. a technocrat? Uh, well, he's dead. Well, no, but was he? Let me think about it. Tomorrowland, uh, you know, uh, animation. He no, probably not. Um, probably not the technocracy, but he was the Weaver because um, the LARP guide take um, the Weaver takes credit for building Disneyland. Okay. So, and until Kathleen Candy and Bob Iger took over, it was a company of the Weaver. I don't. Know, I still think. I still think Mage Disney would be kind of fucking cool to have in a game. Wizard Disney. And next, that's <laughs> fucking saw what maybe posted. Do not put on screen. What? <laughs> what? He he saw what we were talking about before the episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did. All right. And lastly, I want to bring up uh, Chagas Cruzy. Now, you're going to see this guy's name pop up a bunch when we talk about um, if when you read the Ratkin book. It's because he's very similar to Cesar Chavez, the freedom fighter of uh, the Philippines. But the thing is, is that Chagas Cruz is a guy who lost his fucking mind, and he's the guy who shut up the McDonald's at the comic at the start of the story. And he died and became a martyr. And thanks to him and his little manifesto that he wrote, there is this massive um, domestic terror society within the Ratkin that want to plant dirty bombs and shoot up buildings just for the sake of killing humans. Again, this is the Ratkin we're talking about. Yeah, if, if you want to play as a public shooter, we got a breed for you. <laughs> <laughs> and next up, mixing splats. Yeah, so... Uh, they are. It's already well stated. They don't like vampires. Yeah. So oh. this is the the perfect kind of guy to send after a Nosferatu or the Gangrel for that matter, because you're you're going to think it's animalized, but nope, it's going to jump up and kill you. But they are going to get fucked by the Malkavians, the Lasombra, the Ventru, and the Toreador. Any 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 uh clan that has a mental discipline is going to fuck them over. And the Zemichi, um, free food. Basically, yes. See, so come here, little rat. I've got a big surprise for you. you, you might... want, uh, what would you like to be turned into? Of course, the Zemichi might get, like, fucking deathly ill, because vampires don't like poison, I don't imagine. Uh, the, or it could synthesize, and they could become this massive disease carrier that starts rotting the land around them. That That's a terrifying thought right there, and that would need to be killed immediately. Yeah, yeah. Keep the Ratkin and Zemichi separated. Well, given how this New York game is going to go, I don't think we can promise that. Yeah. <laughs> if you have Vigo Corinth and Work Bruiser meet in the same scene, uh... <laughs> we're fucked. Given that we just blew up um, Brooklyn in, in that game. Yeah. That's going to be a little rough. And I would have added Tremere to a list of bad matchups, but the Tremere never leave their homes. So, don't expect to run into a Tremere when you're playing a Ratkin. Uh, next up, the Wizards. The Wizards. So going down the, going down the list of uh, magic traditions, the Akashics maybe actually because the Nazumi exist. Why then? Why the Akashics? Because they are uh, the sages. They are the martial arts masters. And the stargazers know about them, but don't talk to them because the stargazers want to breathe in their farts by themselves. Yes. Um, let's see. The Celestial Chorus, probably no. No. Uh, actually, that, that's not probably no. That, that's a strong no. Yeah. The Rackin don't care about God. Uh, given how they are zealous religious fanatics of the wild, they're not going to listen to what you have to say about God but the capital G. Yes. Uh, Cult of Ecstasy, uh, no. Really? They would not, they would kill the aesthetics and take their, take their drugs. Okay, yeah, that, that sounds a bit more like it. Let's see. The Dream Speakers also no. Uh, even though the Dream Speakers are pretty much on their side, 
they're not going to hear it, and they're going to kill the Dream Speaker anyway. Yeah, because they look like human, so may as well. Uh, Euthanatos. That's going to be a very interesting matchup between the two. Because, you know, the perfect hitmen fighting each other. Yes. So, who's going to kill who first? That's the question. Let's see, as for what else we've got down the line, um, Sons of Ether. Well, I could see the Sons of Ether kidnapping a ratkin and putting him in a giant uh, rat wheel or rat maze. Yeah. And experimenting on the ratkin, only for his lab to be raided three days later and then a brutal murder happens. Yeah, that sounds that sounds about right. Like one of your side quests is a rat can save your friend from a uh, from a son of ether. Let's see, Order of Hermes strong no. Um, on top of that, I really don't see those two ever meeting in in all honesty. Probably not. Uh, Verbena. Um, human sacrifice, pretty cool, but the rat can aren't going to let a human do that. They they rather do the sacrificing themselves. Yes, as I said with the red talons, it's like. Even though they do red sacrifice, they don't want to see it. And the virtual adepts, now that's actually a pretty big rival of the Ratkin, because as we discussed with the freakish shoes in the television realm, the virtual adepts are all about the metaverse. So these two are going to cross paths a lot. And they're going to fuck the with each other. Darkness. Absolutely. In terms of conventions, um, Iteration X is going to have a massive issue with these guys given that they're going to want to crawl into their labs and try to chew up their wires. Um, Tasty wires. Who else? The New World Order? Um, probably don't consider the Ratkin to be a threat, so they won't interact with them. Yeah. Uh, the, the Progenitors. Given that we got the term Lab Rats, you bet the Progenitors are kidnapping Ratkin as a means of using them as a research to try to cure the Changing Plague, as they call it. Uh, I don't think that's gonna happen, B. But you could try. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's what the that's what the progenitors are trying to do. They're trying to cure people becoming rare animals. I mean, Magadon already beat them to it, but yeah. Uh, well, Magadon got their research from the progenitors. Okay, yeah. So then, th yeah. We're, then it's, we're already on the way down. Let's see the syndicate. Uh yes, the the rats are already playing with the syndicate stuff. As after all, they're attacking their television stations, and they're um internet service providers and computer companies, which the syndicate don't like because that's the money mage. So rats hurt the bottom line. The rats need to die. Yes. And lastly, the void engineers. I don't think the I'm void engineers care. Yeah, unless we've got cheese on the moon, they're not going to cross paths. It's cheese, Gromit. Uh, the Nafondi. No. Uh... What's that uh, picture of, um, like, Satan walking up to Tenacious D going, all right, first of all, I'm a huge fan. Uh, was that Tenacious D? <laughs> yeah, it was. I'm trying to think of, like, who would say that to who. I think, like, the Ratkin and the Fondi would say that to each other when it comes to making diseases. Yep. And then they would try to kill each other after doing that. Basically, yes. And Which one Marauders. would sing a song about the other one riding their dick? <laughs> We're talking about something you should never talk about, rat dicks. No. And lastly, the Marauders, given that they make realms the same way, I mean, like, the exact same way, through belief and your belief being wrong, this I would love to see in your stories. If you could please cross over your rats with the Marauders and have, like, a rat step, side, uh, step sideways while inside a Marauder's realm, and then make a realm within that Umbra. That'd be that'd be a weird 40 chess kind of environment. Exactly, and you have like the two of them driving each other insane. It'd be kind of and... funny. Next up, uh, Ghosts. We already said that, you know, the rat don't like to hang around the scene of the crime because they know about the ghosts. <laughs> After all, um... Ryan, if you were a rat, would you want to try to make a habitat in a place that's uh, haunted? Fuck no. I got um, a friend who's big into the paranormal. He's a big ghost believer. And he says, like, with the minute like you start feeling chills whenever you're around a place that's haunted, that's a ghost all looming over your shoulder trying to, like, suck your energy out, in his opinion. Bro, that so, shit ain't real. Fuck out of here. Yeah, well, I'm saying, like, in the world of darkness, it would be. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 
And I'm pretty sure that the Retkin would figure out what's going on, realize it's an enemy they can't fight, and then probably get the hell out of there. Yep. Your friend is actually Dan Aykroyd. You never knew. Yeah. Uh, he's going to tell me about uh, Crystal Head Vodka. Of Niagara Falls while selling me Crystal Head Vodka while cutting an orange as he's talking. Yes. You have to listen to Dan Aykroyd talk for 10 seconds. He, not, he automatically loses you. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty incredible. I mean, I don't think even Joe Rogan can keep up with him. <laughs> All right, and um, changelings. Now, here's the thing. There is a ratkin little realm, a, a little condensed realm, that is stuffed into a gateway leading into Arcadia. Is that why they know what the fairies are? Yes, because they are occupying a gateway that leads into the cha- uh, into the dreaming. So they cross paths a lot, but I don't imagine the uh, Seelia are very happy about that. Uh, nobody's happy about that. You have to have the fairies constantly chasing them up with broomsticks every day. They're gonna look. They're gonna find out that uh, that Chico's a bonar, and they're gonna say you let the rat man into our house, and he's gonna bring in all the rats. Lux, the rats don't. It rat isn't his totem. He's fine. <laughs> and the shadow court. I can imagine um, the ratkin having a big issue with them. I mean. The minute they find out that these massive Doomer fairies and the Ratkin are going to say, you can't be a Doomer. I'm the only Doomer allowed to be around here. And they try to kill the Shadow Court. Quite, quite literally, this town ain't big enough for the two of us. Nope. Same with the Nefondi. And Hunters, we always said the Hunters won't really pay them any attention. Demon the Fallen. Hmm. Um, they would get along great with the Ravagers for a day before they would start trying to kill each other. Yes. Uh, once the genocide is done, they would quickly turn on each other. Um, cryptics. The rats don't have any answers, so the cryptics won't interact with them at all. Yes. Um, unless they were approached by the rats, in that case, the cryptic would quickly wipe the floor with them. Um, who's next? The Faustians. Given that they have, uh, they tend to have a lot of like um, manipulative mind powers. I can quickly see. A rat cult forming around the Faustian. Yeah, either that or like as we said, how important contracts are to a uh, to the rat society. They uh, they would basically be trying to like out Faustian each other. Uh, they would have the the statue of Pazuzu in Bohemian Grove. Yeah, something like that. And now that I come to think of it, like the rat king would be all up for the cremation of care ceremony. It's like, hey, they that kills me. I could just make another one. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and the Luciferians and the Reconcilers, absolutely no way. They both love humanity in very different ways. Yes. There is no way a Lu- that Lucifer and his army or the Reconcilers would tolerate the Reckon at all. Luciferians just show up like, yo, yo, what the fuck are you doing? We're, we're kill deathing all the humans. Why? <laughs> Hasbun Hotel is out by the time we're doing this episode on Amazon Prime. I've been meaning to watch and it. Swearing aside, that iteration of Luz- Lucifer in Hasbun Hotel actually is not that different from how Lucifer is in um, World Darkness. Yeah. Perhaps someone on the that, writing staff knows. Because he's still technically an angel, and he loves humanity, but in a very god defying kind of way after all lucifer is the intellect that falls in love with itself mm-hmm. so he would love to preserve humanity and be their god where he or at least he believes god has failed and the rat king want to kill all humans so you see where this is going lucifer when he gets his ass kicked by some idiot and from georgia with a fiddle <laughs> was that guy a hunter he's probably a hunter probably. see well you remember the lyrics of that song? No matter like, no matter how he wins, the devil gets a good outcome out of it because you're walking around. You're the guy walking around with the golden fiddle. You're asking for a man in the woods to rob you. Have you seen Deliverance? I have seen Deliverance. Yes. That you're you're going to get delivered. But no, all he's going to do is just run over to a pawn shop, pawn it off for some cash money, you buy yourself a brand new fiddle, and you're good. You, you better go to a bank and cash. Um, go to an ATM pretty quickly. Get that on your card before somebody mugs you. That would actually be, like, a really interesting story. Like, he gets the fiddle of gold from defeating Lucifer in the fiddle fight, 
or in the uh, fiddle off, and then yeah. like every <laughs> he the devil plays a trick on him where it's like, oh, the golden uh, <laughs> violence actually cursed, and it's the source of all your problems. <laughs> your greed and ambition for wanting to defeat me at my own game has accidentally thrown you into into a moral lesson about the uh, about the nature of greed and ambition. There we go. You can have something like the um, the Miracle Man from no no you didn't you don't read JoJo you don't know what I'm talking about you got him right I don't I'm illiterate. Uh, the Miracle Man is a curse that the minute you get like a cursed dollar bill you constantly gain money and when you try to spend it you get twice the amount you spent immediately back in your hands. That's kind of neat. Until you get to the point where you have so much money and so much cash and capital that it begins to kill you. I think I remember like fucking Jello Apocalypse did a joke about that. You get buried beneath all of your money, and um, that's it. I think we've covered covered everything. Uh, besides that's the so. pre-generated characters, which I honestly don't think are that interesting in this book. Yep, the rat can. They're slimy. They're greasy. They love evil. you know killing people. I, they're evil. They're evil. Uh, now yeah. sing that to the tunes of uh, the Adams Family. <laughs> they're slimy and they're goopy. They're evil and they're kooky. They're also yep. murder kooky. The the rat can here to play. Whatever. And you're trying to scare me with your Wednesday personality right now. Uh, <laughs> I never I never watched Wednesday. <laughs> uh, like Adam's Family Values is like the extent of my knowledge of the Adam's Family. That's only because that movie fucking slaps. See. I know it exists. And that's the extent of my knowledge. I I just love the um I just love the whole summer camp scene where Wednesday sabotages the play. It's fucking awesome. See, we we released a giant show on Netflix, and come to think of it, streaming. You know, it, it's weird yeah. that like they did the whole oh she's an edgy girl in this happy go lucky world, but like. Have you seen the fucking malls of the early 2000s? Wednesday Adams would fit right the fuck in at a fucking good Charlotte or, or My Chemical Romance concert. You, you think the reason why we're getting like a crappy ass um, Avatar show that thinks Avatar The Last Airbender was sexist is because the Ratkin are in the Avatar The Last Airbender realm and messing it up? That's it. That, I feel like they've just been Probably. doing that for net. They've been doing that to Netflix for like the past for like the past couple of years. And then, like, one of them got baned and made cuties, and then they had to kill him and dial it back. <laughs> a a Setite paid them to make that movie? Basically, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I know a way to get this, this you know, streaming site shut down. Child porn, make this movie. And now they're making another one with George Lucas as the director and Megan the Stallion as the main character. Oh, good lord. <laughs> I think I may have gone too far in a few places. So uh, you see, this is just the only movie I really wanted to make. This um, this is why I sold off Star Wars so I could have the, the money to make Kitties too. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Good lord. Yeah, the Rat Can are evil little shits, but they're also a lot of fun stupid. to play. Play the Rat Can. And put the Rat Can yes. in your game. Yeah, well, if, if if you got a, a multiple like Changing Breeds game, the Rat Can actually are worth checking out. Yes. So, um, I think that'll do and, it. Ryan, do we have an idea? I have no ideas. All right. I'm barely coherent. All right. All right. Let's, we're going to let this man cook. All right. Get out, stop watching this video. Good night. All right. Good night, have everybody. Good night, guys. GN.